Everybody hear me? Okay. Um, I actually I, I will be doing a share screen, have a PowerPoint ready to go, but but until then, uh, just to let you know, um, introduce myself. I, my name is Dustin Jansen. Um, I'm originally from uh, New Mexico. Came up to Utah to go to college, and never left. It feels like <laughs> probably like a lot of people here, um, but I enjoy Utah. I think it's a beautiful place, and I and and, I, and since I've um, acquire children. I like it even more. So, um, but I, like I said, I'm, I'm Navajo. I'm, I grew up on the Navajo reservation, just North of Gallup, New Mexico. If there's any Navajos out there. Yate. Um, uh, maybe, maybe you should find out if we're related. Um, I don't know. 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 That's really just, so if there's anybody that shares those plans with me out on the out in the Zoom world, where we're probably related, you can go ahead and extend that um, that relationship, and 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 we'll we'll go from there. <laughs> um, I'm gonna, I you know when I this is a a consultation training, and we did a a, a kind of a short abbreviated one with Shippo, and um, just to get people on the same page and, and really to encourage departments and divisions to um, have active consultations with tribes. And um, I'm gonna uh, share my screen real quick. Let me see how, share screen, um, one participant. Let me see, we'll share that screen and I'll hit share. All right, can you guys see me? Can you guys see my screen? Yes, okay. Yes. Let me let me play that uh, from the start. All right, I hope you can all see that. Um, so I would, you know, just thinking about what I, you know, sharing my clan in, in Navajo uh, culture, you're you're born into a clan system. You get a clan from your mother, your father, your paternal grandfather, and your and your maternal grandfather. Um, and at, usually you, you, you enter, when you introduce yourself, you say, hey, this is me. This is where I come from, basically. And we, we establish a little bit of a relationship there. Um, relationships are very important in a lot of tribal cultures, and especially Navajo culture, where we get a little more elaborate than most tribes. But the idea is if, if we know how we're related to one another, we're going to treat each other a certain way. And I thought about this when I thought about it. it's a state consultation training um, where if like if I, I said my mother's clan is Red House. OK, therefore, if I meet any woman, any Navajo woman that has a Red House clan I and she's old enough, I could call her mother. OK. I said, you know, my, my grandfather's clan was walks around people. If I if I meet any male who has the walks around clan, I can call them grandfather. And we can treat each other like that. And this idea of creating relationship is what the Navajos call eh. Okay. They call it eh. And um, it's, it's a general idea that everything's related. Everyone is related. And if you establish that relationship, you're probably going to treat each other different, hopefully in a good way. <laughs> Some people are like, oh, he's my brother. I can talk mean to him. But in Navajo culture, if he's your brother, you should treat him well. You know, if that's your sister, you treat them well. If this is your mother, you treat them well. If this is your father, you treat them well. Everything and everyone is related at some point. And uh, I... I think it's very applicable here right now that I'm thinking about this travel consultation training because um, our actions affect one another, you know, and it doesn't matter what division you're in, what department you're in, um, any action you make, any action you take, any words you say have effect on different departments, divisions. And in some cases, they do have an effect on tribal government as well. So I'd like you to, to just uh, keep aware of that and, and be aware that sometimes the things that you do in, a, in your position with the state can have an effect on the tribes that are located within the state.
Okay, so I'll keep that keep that there, and if you could just keep that in mind. Um, I I really like when I start doing these. I I think what's a good practice for everyone to do is to just do what we call a land acknowledgement. When you're working with tribes and you're meeting with tribal leaders to just do a land acknowledgement, let them know that um, you, you're, you're familiar with the state, you're familiar with the tribes within the state, you're familiar um, uh, with where people grew up, who was, who was living where. Um, that, that's, a, that's a big thing. And normally a land acknowledgement is nothing more than saying, hello, you know, it, it's good to be here on X land where X tribe <laughs> has been located. I do that all the time. I didn't realize how much I did that until um, a few years ago when land acknowledgements became almost the norm when working with tribes. I you know, I'm trained as an attorney. I worked as a tribal court judge and I, a lot of my work pre-state pre of Utah dealt with um, working with tribal governments. And I never realized that I've always done a land acknowledgement. Uh, for example, I grew up in a place called, uh, Gal well, just north of Gallup, New Mexico. And about an hour south of Gallup, New Mexico is uh, another reservation called the Zuni Pueblo. And when I would do work down there and I would have to speak with their tribal councils, I would always say, you know, hey, this is me. This is where I'm from. It's good to be back here in Zuni. You know, it's, it's a beautiful place. I, I appreciate how the Zuni tribe has taken care of their land, how much of their, their, um, their, their structures are still safe and well-maintained, that their, the, the landscape around them is still beautiful and clean and nice, and it's always nice to come back to Zuni. That in itself is a land acknowledgement. I'm, I'm stating that I know where I'm at. I know whose land I'm on. And I appreciate the stewardship um, that they've taken over that land. And, and I appreciate that relationship that they have with that land. And that, that is something that if you work with tribes, you should get in the habit of doing. And it doesn't have to be super formal, but it, it, it can just be a few words in passing like that. It's good to be here. You know, hey, I'm 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 happy to go out to Ibopal, Utah. I love this place. It's beautiful. You guys, I, I love the way that you main you maintain um, its beauty and and make it relevant uh, to yourselves daily. It's good to be here. You know, that that in itself is a as a land acknowledgement. That's something that you should get in the habit of doing. Um, something else that we should probably all get in the habit of doing is um, knowing which tribes actually. Ex um, are located in the state of Utah. <laughs> uh, sometimes uh, we say, we, we just say tribes of Utah, uh, but the reality is we need to, we need to acknowledge the tribes by name. You know, we need to say the Skull Valley Band of Goshutes. We need to say the Confederate Tribes of Goshu. We need to say the San Juan Southern Paiute, the Paiute Indian Tribes of Utah, the Northwestern Band of Shoshone, the, the Ute Indian Tribes of the Uinta and Ore Reservation, the Ute Mountain Ute, and their White Mesa community located here in Southern Utah, and the Navajo Nation. We need to say them by name, get used to saying their names and be familiar with their names. There's eight tribes. So that's a lot to remember, but it's a lot less than some states, right? New Mexico, where I grew up, there's like 23 tribes. Arizona is like 28 tribes. And so it's a little harder to do it there, but in Utah, it's possible. And it's a good habit to get into and knowing where these tribes are located. Uh, one of the first things uh, that I'd like to get into is um, the governor's um, executive order um, that requires consultation with tribes and tribal governments. Okay. And a lot of what I'll be sharing with you here is straight out of his executive order. It's, it's pretty short. Okay. Uh, and um, I can get a copy of that for everyone and, and, and make sure you all have it. But this executive order, it's basically setting up a, a way for tribes and the state of Utah to do business together and to do business in a way that's beneficial for everyone and that where everyone feels good about things. 
And, um, you know, when I, when I took this position, I, I was appointed to this position in February, February, the first week of February, February 8th, I think. And um, one of the first things that uh, the governor said to me was, was Dustin, we, we need to make things better here between the state of Utah and the tribes. We've, you know, there's been mistakes made. Uh, things were done that shouldn't have been done. Things were said that shouldn't have been said. And we need to make that better. And so I said, okay, let's see what we can do. And from my from my experience in just a few months that I've been here, I, I'm happy to report that, you know, the governor has been true to that. He's 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 been wanting uh to improve those relationships. Uh, the attorney general's office is assisting in that. And really every department um director that I've met has been on board with that also. And to make sure that happens and, and happens in a, in a good way, um, I think it's good that we follow the, the governor's executive order that he put out. And it, and it has a purpose, right? Let me, let me see if I can move some things around. There we go. Um, this first purpose um, listed with the, within the governor's order is that you know, it recognizes the state as a sovereign state and it's a state that acts in the in the public interest for the betterment of its citizens and strives to ensure that the rights of its citizens to participate in the government process for the betterment of its citizens. Okay, so that we'll, we're going to come back to that. Then it goes on in the next phrase to say that the federal that the federally recognized Indian tribes located wholly or partially within the state are sovereign nations with similar rights and duties to act for the benefit of their citizens and to act on behalf of the public welfare of their tribal nations. So we have two separate sovereigns that are that are brought up here. We have a state sovereign, right? It has a government, a governor, we have a, a, an executive branch, a legislative branch, a judi judicial branch, and all the executive departments located um, in the executive branch acting for the benefit and betterment of its citizens. Um, usually at this point, I ask people, who are the citizens of Utah? Um, and um, and it's, it's who you think it is. <laughs> but also, those citizens include um, all Utah citizens living on reservations. Okay? Uh, Native people living on reservations are citizens of Utah. And they vote in local elections. They can run for public office, county, state offices. They could even run for Congress um, if they wanted to, as citizens of Utah. Okay. So when when the governor is saying, "Hey, we need to improve these relationships," it's not just because he wants to have a better relationship between the state government and the tribal government. He wants to do right by this, all his citizens in the state of Utah including those native people living on reservations within the state. Okay, that's important to recognize. The governor recognizes that he's not just the governor of, of non-reservation lands. He's the, res he's the governor of the entire state of Utah. And his obligation for the betterment of its citizens includes the native people that live on these reservations. Now let's go to that second that second part there. Um, and we'll, we'll flesh this out a little bit. He he obviously can't exercise um, authoritative jurisdiction on reservations because tribes have a government and they have a sovereign nation, and it's it's stated right here. And so tribes located on re on reservations have governments have. A, a form of legislature, have a form of executive, have a form of, of judicial services that may or may not be similar to the state or the federal governments, but they exist. And these elected tribal leaders have a duty to act in the benefit of their citizens. Now, their jurisdiction, their authoritative jurisdiction, lies within um, Indian country, lies within the, the, the traditional geographical bounds or reservation boundaries where their citizens are located. Okay, so you have two governments working for the benefit of their citizens, 
And now these governments aren't always going to get along. They're not always going to be on the same page and they're not always, that doesn't mean they're fighting, but it may not, it may, they have, they may have different approaches um, to whatever, whatever issues come up. And so the state would like to make that cooperation, that collaboration work better, work smooth, and, and in a way where both the citizens of Utah and the citizens of, uh, of reservations can benefit. Okay, so that, and for that reason, he put out this executive order. Okay, let me see. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, the state is committed to engage in regular, meaningful consultation with the tribes with the development of state policies. Hey, Dusty, can I jump? Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, Paula actually asked a great question in the chat. Um, she wanted to know about non-federally recognized tribes or entities. Okay, so it's, that's, that's really, okay, so we have tribes that are recognized by the federal government as sovereign nations. Um, there's about 574 of these tribes within the United States today and, and Canada. I'm not, not including Canada, but if we include Alaska and the, the lower 48, 574 tribes that are recognized by the federal government. There are tribes within the United States that are not federally recognized as sovereign nations. Um, some of these tribes may be state recognized. Okay, the, one of the largest tribes in the United States is the Lumbee tribe in North Carolina, um, but they are not a federally recognized tribe. They have a government, they have land recognized within the state of North Carolina as Lumbee land. Um, and they actually have a relationship with the state of, of North Carolina. But they exist um, and, they, and they can create agreements with, with, within the state. And then you have tribes that are neither state or federally recognized. Okay. The, the biggest difference between these is, is who you can form relationships with. If you're a federally recognized tribe, you can form relationships with the federal government and the state government. If you're a state recognized tribe, it usually starts and stops with the state. If you're not recognized at all, then the fed, neither the federal government or the state governments are obligated to recognize you as a sovereign nation acting in the benefit of, its, of your people. Um, we have eight federally recognized tribes in Utah. Are there, are there a couple groups in Utah that want to be recognized? Absolutely. Uh, we just got a letter the other day uh, from a group that wanted the state to recognize them as, as, a, as a government. And, um, and so we're going to set a meeting with them and talk to them about that. And, but, and there are, and then there are conglomerates or, uh, or groups of Indians from a bunch of different tribes sometimes that get together and they say, well, we're, we're an Indian community. We should have representation. Let's form something. But that doesn't mean that that's going to happen either. You know, we have a couple of those up in Brigham City and, um, and, a couple, and a couple communities in the East that are trying to have the state recognize them. Um, is that the type of answer that we're getting at or... <laughs> we had some follow-up questions. Um, okay. Oya asked, what about tribes that claim ancestral lands in Utah? As archaeologists, we think a lot about that. Yeah, absolutely. So that, that goes to the spirit of this consultation, right? Um, there, for example, the Ute tribe. The, the tribe, the, the Ute Nation, the, the northern Utes of the Uinta and Ori reserva reservations, we, we think of them just being out in Fort Duchesne area or in, in the Vernal areas. But the Utes um, were a very large tribe. They covered a lot of land. They covered almost the, in, from the middle of Ute, current Utah all the way into the middle of Colorado. And the entire north south area of, of that from from northern colorado northern utah all the way down into new mexico in fact into northern new mexico that is their ancestral lands right 
there are a number of different Ute tribes today. Um, besides the UN, the Uint and Ore, we have the we have the Ute Mountain Ute in Toyot, Colorado. We have the Southern Ute in Ignacio, but they were all one people. Okay, just different bands of people, and so yeah, you're and as time progressed and as as different agreements were made or not made, and some were just forced removals and forced relocations. Um, tribes may find themselves in areas that weren't originally theirs, but they still hold um, onto um, maybe sacred sites, uh, burial sites, um, traditional sites, ancestral sites, and as part of their culture. Um, so there are tribes that, that do hang on to that. Um, and can exercise a certain degree of of claim onto that, at least as far as protections go. Um, but as far as occupying those areas, if they're not currently occupying it, that's that's a that's a court battle that they're going to have to take. Um, is there something more more in detail that you that w was was attached to that question? Um, is it just like, hey, we're building a road, we we hit a pot? And <laughs> it's on state land, but we recognize this was on ancestral land. What should we do? Is that the type of question we're, that this was going towards? Um, uh, so I, I, I would need a little more information to, to answer that. But yeah, there's tribes that, that do lay claim to traditional areas, um, ancestral areas of land. And, and sometimes um, the federal government and the federal courts will recognize that tie. Um, to it. Not always. If you remember a few years ago in North Dakota, um, they were laying the Dakota Access Pipeline and uh, as a, the, this, the Sioux uh, tribe uh, in Cannonball was protesting that. And it, it had originally been a part of their traditional lands. And then when they signed a treaty, it was still a part of their, their, their reservation outlined in that treaty. And then another treaty was was put upon them um, that didn't specifically reduce that land, but it did it did um, uh, draw a new border. And when when treaty language doesn't specifically um, obliterate or <laughs> a reservation that that those ties and that that right or access to that traditional land is usually still there. Um, that that case is. And is still in court, and they're still arguing the merits um, of that. And if uh, this tribe can can seek protections on traditional lands that are not part of their current reservation boundaries, so that that can happen. Uh, but we can get into this a little more, um, and what you should do, right? Um, because I I feel like these policies and the purposes of this um, executive order actually do address that, and and how we should move forward. Um, one of these, the things in the, in the governor's executive order, it requires regular and meaningful participation or consultation. And we, we're going to talk about what that really means. Is it just a phone call? Is it just an email? Is it just a letter? Is it a face-to-face -face meeting? Um, and, uh, and the short answer is yes, it's all of those things. Um, if it's regular and if, means you're going to do it you know at, at points in time but is it meaningful um how meaningful is it is it just enough to make a call just enough to send an email just enough to throw a letter in the mail is it just enough to, to have an actual face to face meeting on it um and if you're really trying to have meaningful consultation if it's something that's important you're probably going to do everything you can to make sure that words are exchanged and ideas exchanged and, and agreements are made. Um, and, this, and this executive order, you know, the governor said he hereby orders that state agency as defined here and establish a tribal consultation policy. Okay. Um, so he wants he wants state agencies to figure out a way that work for that agency to communicate with tribes. And we'll talk about what situations those are and, and when that should happen. Oh. Okay, 
I and, oh, go ahead. I'm going to Ben while you're pausing really quick. Don Montoya asked another follow up. Does Utah acknowledge tribes claiming ancestral lands as formal consulting parties? What does that mean? Hey, Don, what? do you want to put yourself off mute and maybe you can uh, ask a little more clearly than I can? I think he might be having trouble unmuting. Okay. Um, so maybe, maybe Don, you can um, clarify in the group chat and we can pose that question in a little bit. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I don't, I'm not quite sure what that, what he's asking on there. Um, okay. We'll but, think, get back to you. All right on. <laughs> um, and I in here, and this is really, a, a UN declaration, okay? But, and it's when it says states here, it's, it's, it's referring to, right, an international uh, government. But I thought that the spirit of the executive order from the governor, it really, it really took this into heart, you know? It says states shall consult and cooperate, cooperate in good faith with indigenous peoples concerned through their own representative institutions in order to obtain their free and informed consent prior to the approval of any project affecting their lands and territories and other resources, particularly in connection with the development, utilization, and exploitation of mineral water and other resources. Now, this, this is really strong language, right? This is, this is a, probably an idealistic language that, um, that's put forward, but I think this language is put forward to to at least begin the conversation. Um, if you're doing something that has a direct effect on tribes or or tribal governments, maybe you're going to have to give them a call and find out where they're at on that. Okay, and we'll talk about why that's important and, and why we should why we should act that way when we when we make a decision as a department. And you're going through your 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 line items and saying, "Did we do this? Did we do this? Did we do this?" And you're trying to make sure that your decision is is solid and a good one. One of those questions that you should be asking yourself, and getting the habit of asking, is, "Okay, this is going down in Brigham City. Is this going to have any effect on the northwest band of Shoshone?" Now, this is going down in Wendover, Nevada. Is this going to have any effect on the Skull Valley Goshoot or the Confederate Tribes of Goshoot? Um, get into the habit of, of asking yourself whether your agency's actions are going to have that direct effect on tribal nations. And if it is, you know, give them a call, send them, set up a meeting. Don't don't let this be something that that comes up later and says, "Hey, why didn't you tell us about this?" Be proactive on this and you know, create trust and improve those relationships. That's Elizabeth? Another, another question. Sorry to cut you off a little. It's all right. Um, Sue wants to know if, um, so are we seeking tribal input or their consent if a project affects ancestral lands that are not on a reservation? Well, I guess it really de it depends. Let's look at... Um, the bear's ears, for example, okay? Let's look at bear's ears. On, and that is not currently on any reservation, but it, it is ancestral lands for for the Ute, the Navajo, the Hopi, the Zuni, and, and probably Paiutes uh, down there. And, and on those ancestral lands where, especially where, where things are located, right? Um, you have dwellings, you, and it may be considered a sacred site. Um, you should be seeking um, a consultation on those sites. Um, you, should, you should be able to sit down and say, hey, how do we do this? How can we do this in a way that respects culture, that respects um, not just cultures? And I get into this a lot because I think we tend to put dates on things and that, and we want to, and, and sometimes that's appropriate, but I, I think it, when you put dates on things, it, it kind of says that something has stopped happening. 
and these sacred sites um, or in, at least sites, the ancestral lands that uh, tribes will respond to still have meaning and are probably still being used. Um, uh, if, and so even though it's not part of my reservation, we, my people are still using that for a certain purpose. Okay. And, um, and, it, and the, the spirit behind this executive order is to create better relationships between the states and the tribes. Um, whether or not that is current reservation land within current reservation boundaries shouldn't be the, the determinant um, factor in saying, should I call this tribe, right? If you know it's going to affect this tribe and their ability uh, to, to live in a way that they've lived for years, then consultation is appropriate. Does that answer that question? Uh, because we, we tend to say, you know, tribes are here, they're not here, you know, they're not, this isn't within their current reservation boundaries, so therefore they don't need to use it. Therefore, they don't have access to it. Therefore, that part of their religion is no longer um, uh, valid. Therefore, that part of their culture is no longer valid. All because a government other than their own has drawn a boundary there. Okay. If you want to have good relationships, you need to recognize that that boundary wasn't a traditional boundary. And that current boundary doesn't affect cultural practice or religious practice of these people. And so, yeah, it would be totally appropriate to, to the consultation if it's affecting, uh, directly affecting these tribes. Does that, is, does that make sense? Is, is there a follow-up question to that? Yeah, Sue says that does answer it. Um, she says, you know, just to sort of, I guess, put a box around it. We're not asking for consent. We're consulting to protect special places and respect culture, correct? Yes. Yeah. In, in an effort to help in, in, in this, to, uh, to maintain good working relationships between the state and the tribe. Okay. All right. So who are who who does this? <laughs> Agencies, right? Any executive agency or department that makes policy that has or may have a substantial direct effect on one or more of the tribes. Um, agency officials, any individual or individuals designated and authorized to represent an agency for the purpose of implement, implementation of an agency's tribal policy. So we're just saying what an agency is. Who are these officials? Um, well, let's go into what consultation is. What does it mean to consult? Um, uh, again, I think what, what can be scary is probably language in this UN declaration that is that doesn't have bearing on the state of Utah, okay? But in the language in here, and this is an idealistic language that quite frankly, almost no nation in the world follows, but this is nonetheless put forward by the UN. Consent prior to the approval of any project, right? Um, a tribe's probably not gonna stop you from doing it, okay? Especially if it's not within current reservation boundaries, unless they go to court and, and make the argument and make it stop. What we're looking for here in consultation is how can we make it work? When the state has interest, the tribe has interest, how do we make it work? Okay. So consultation, the process by which the state and tribes may have the opportunity to exchange views and information in writing or in person regarding implementation of proposed state action that has or may have substantial tribal implications. So this let's let's look. One, tribal cultural practices, tribal lands, tribal resources, access to traditional areas of tribal culture or religious importance. So to that question, yeah, um, even though it's not within the current reservation boundaries, um, if it's a traditional area and it has importance to cultural practice, yeah, it's gonna be something that you need to consult on, it's proper. Um, 
the ability of an Indian tribe to govern and provide services to its members, right? If, if what the state's doing or what your agency wants to do interferes with the tribe's ability to, to govern or provide services to its members, you're probably, you're going to need to, to set up a consultation meeting. Um, and Indian tribes formal relationship with the state, right? If the governor has a has an agreement going on and your agency is doing something to disrupt that um, relationship, you're going you're gonna to need to contact the governor and the tribe and figure out how to work around it uh, or find a, I'll find alternatives. Because uh, you know they they may agree with you. Hey, you need to do this, and this is gonna this kind of contradicts what we had agreed to before let's see where we can go from here or they might just say you need to figure out how to do this a different way but just be prepared for those um or the consideration of the state's responsibilities to indian tribes again that involves a state state um, obligations that are assumed by the state all right or it may be may concern pass through dollars right the federal government sends money to the state and the state has to administer it the state if your agency action is interfering with that state's ability to to carry out its federal function in past two areas um, you're going you're going to have to have consultation so just keep a keep an eye out for these again this is this is not my language this is language directly from the executive order so if you're if you're really looking at hey when do i need to consult with tribes it's listed for you right within the executive order but do you have any questions on what these might mean Yes, let me jump in. We did have a couple of questions from the chat. Okay. Uh, let me find one. All right. So a, a follow-up again. You've you've mentioned give them a call a few times, like, oh, give the tribes a call. Yeah. Um, we, <laughs> we would like to know, what does that mean? Uh, so this question specifically is posed by a new forest supervisor, and she's wondering who she should call directly. Is that the tribal chairperson okay so what you would do in that case is you would call the utah department of indian affairs or division of indian affairs <laughs> you would say this is what we're calling about who's my counterpart right who's the person that i i speak to within that tribe and that's a big part of what um, udia does we're here to make sure that the state and tribes are communicating effectively and part of that responsibility is making sure you're in contact with the correct person. So um, if it's about water, we'll find the person that handles water or natural resources. It's a, if it's about uh, transportation, most tribes have a department of transportation that we can put you in contact with. Um, you know, usually when the governor wants to speak to somebody, he wants to speak to his counterpart um, uh, on his level. So we'll, we'll find a president or the chairman um, a chairperson that is able to to speak and and so yeah so that's that a good resource would be utah division of indian affairs and depending on who you want to get in contact with we can find you that number okay fantastic um we had another question so what should someone do someone who's tasked with consultation what should they do if they talk to their tribe that is um, you know, involved, who has ancestral ties, who has current ties on the land. And the tribe says that they don't want anything to happen on the land. How can, how can people navigate that conflict? Then it, it, again, the, it depends on what you're asking for, right? If, if you're saying, Hey, we're going <laughs> to, we found we we dug up some bodies on accident on the side of the road when we were expanding the highway, um, and the tribe says, "Yeah, we'd like those back." And the state said, "No, <laughs> this is extreme. The state would never say this. <laughs> um, probably not." You're right. Um, this the state, the, and the state would say, "No, you're not. It's not going to happen." Um, or the or the tribe comes in there and says, where are you digging? And they go in there and they grab it themselves or something, you know, and it creates some conflict. Um, if they're, if the conflict is bad enough and serious enough, you're probably going to end up in court. Okay. That's just the reality of it. You'll, you'll probably end up in federal court or uh, some type of federal administrative court. Uh, you might get sued. 
And I will say that many of these uh, conflicts that seem unresolvable, that end up in court, court really ends up just triggering uh, a settlement. And it, it triggers a more formal type of consultation between the two entities where, where resolution can come about. So I, I, I wouldn't be uh, super afraid of that idea, all right, of that, that happening. Uh, just if it comes to that, there's mechanisms in place and it's usually a legal mechanism. And, it's, and if, you really want the, if you really want things to work out, you really feel like you can work things out, you're going to approach your the, the governor, and the governor's going to approach the AG's office, and the AG's office is going to probably contact us at Utah Division of Indian Affairs, and we're going to set up a meeting and and start uh, really working on this communication uh, to make sure that some type of uh, of resolution comes about. And so, don't I wouldn't panic on that. There's always a way to figure these things out. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, um, oh, go ahead. Oh, is, our, is there another question? Oh, there are so many questions, Dusty. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's really great. People are, are engaged and, uh, you know, coming, coming from our perspective as archaeologists who are working within agencies, um, this is really helpful because we run into a lot of these questions and we just sort of guess at the answer. So it's, it's so great to have you here. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, well, if I don't answer it well, <laughs> we'll probably get to it <laughs> in the slides. Um, and so, um, well, okay, well, you know, okay. Maybe, tell me if this is going to be answered later. Um, does the state of Utah differentiate between government to government consultation and consultation required under Section 106 of the NHPA? And uh, are, are you familiar enough with Section 106 of NHPA? Probably not, no. <laughs> um, what is what's the what's the gist of that so that is um that's federal law and it's it stipulates that um any federal agency that is engaging in and undertaking something that's going to you know have federal funds or affect federal land um if it if it touches on some tribal aspect um that you have to conduct government to government consultation. So the okay. appropriate people from that federal agency must contact the appropriate people from that tribal organization. And so um, Robert Begay's question is, does the state of Utah differentiate um, between government to government consultation and section 106 consultation? So I think what he's asking is in that governor's executive order, does that check two boxes? And Robert, maybe you can jump in and make sure that I'm asking that question correctly. Or if the federal consultation, um, that does it outweigh the state consultation that could happen? Yes, that might be another way to think of it. Okay, so I think initially the, 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 the government to government relationship in it is let, let's think of this as 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 a hierarchy right, right, in, in federalism. <laughs> um, the the feds are the fed agreement is probably going to outweigh any state agreement there. Okay, if that if that makes sense. Um, but if you see that this that the state or that the federal government is maybe missing something, right? Maybe your state has a special relationship with this tribe in this area, and you have a history in this cert in this one one piece here that the state and the tribe has been working on for like 50 years and they've they've come into an agreement about how to use this area and and they they work with each other and they've been doing this for decades and then the federal government steps in and says hey we're changing all of that you can definitely become a or asked to be a part of that discussion right where states and tribes can tell the federal government hey this is what we've been doing for years this is why we've been doing it, and this is who it benefits, this is how it benefits, and maybe this is how we should work, right? But um, if, if the federal government has an obligation to consult with tribes, then they're going to do that. And if the tribe likes what it's doing with the state, the, the tribe's going to take that into consideration when it negotiates and, and consults with the federal government. 
And so I, I wouldn't, again, I wouldn't go into these areas thinking it's, this has been happening and it's completely going to end right now. Okay. In, in law, you can always talk. Okay. In law, if there's parties and they all have an equal say at a table, you're going to be able to, to work some things out in ways that you haven't thought about. Okay. Don't never, when it comes to a lot of things, don't go into, don't, especially the legal things, don't go into thinking this is how it's going to end. Right. Go into things thinking this is how we can work it out. All right. This is how we're going to make it work. There's always going to be a way to make it work. And it may not be exactly what you want. Okay. It may change a few things, but you're, you're always going to have a voice there, especially if your relationships are good. Right. Um, when I was working with the Navajo Nation um, in their water rights um, division, and there was, a, there was a time where the Navajo Nation was entering into a settlement with the Little Colorado River and the state of Arizona. The Hopi tribe was involved in that too. And there was protests going on um, all the time. Um, there, there was uh, non-Indian protests. There was Navajo protests. There was Hopi protests. There was what they call grassroots organization protests. And, um, and they, they were pretty vocal, you know. And I remember... Um, uh, you know, the one thing we heard and was this, idea, somebody says to us, don't settle for anything less than a hundred percent, you know, and I got my car and I was driving home and, you know, and I realized, well, that's not a settlement at all. <laughs> if you got a hundred percent, that's getting everything you wanted. You didn't settle for anything, right? You got what you wanted and settlement consultation which oftentimes leads to settlement is that ability to find as much as you can to agree upon identify the things you cannot agree upon and work towards a resolution on those things okay when you when you when you settle you're not just saying this is it and everything else we're going to fight each other for the rest of our lives don't put deadlines on that. You don't agree on it today. You may, but you may find ways to agree on it tomorrow. Okay. Don't just because you don't, it's not part of your original settlement. It doesn't mean you're not going to find ways to make things work later on the other areas you didn't agree upon. Uh, Mr. Brigade, you have a question? Yeah. The reason why I ask, I, I, one of the things that I was thinking about was, Sorry about the echo. That's all right. I hear no echo. <laughs> oh, okay, great. Hey, Dustin, um, nice to meet you. Hey, uh, the reason why I'm asked, in from the federal side, uh, we do a lot of Section 106 consultation to the National Historic Preservation Act, but we also do government to government. A lot of the feedback that we get from tribes across the Navajo Nation, across from Ute, Zuni, Hopi, and all the 21 Pueblos in the state of New Mexico. And the, in the Apaches, they always say, you know what, don't, you, you consult it with the wrong person. You have to consult with the right people within the government. Let's say it's government to government, at least on the Navajo Nation side, it's the president. That's government to government between our regional director and um, the Navajo Nation president. For Section 106, it's still the same. So just to say consultation, and I'm asking if the state of Utah said, you know, we can't consult with the local Navajo person just, you know, that lives on the spot because they don't speak on behalf of the, of the tribe itself. So mm -hmm. I, that was the reasons why I said, does the state of Utah understand, um, recognize government to government or Section 106? or just consultation in general. What okay. Was, so that's the reason I was asking. Thank and you. That, and that's, that's a really good point. Uh, thank you. Um, and let's, let's, I'm going to, I'm going to go back to bears here just because that was recent. And, and I think that this is, it's a good example of things. So the question is, or the, the statement is government to government means 
the two government <laughs> representatives talk and make an agreement. Sometimes um, states um, uh, don't do that. <laughs> and then we, and you have to, okay? Um, just for exactly what you said. So there was a, a county leader down in San Juan County who happened to be Navajo, okay? The state consulted with her on behalf of the Navajo people. She was a county official. She was not a Navajo Nation elected official. So she could speak on behalf of the Navajo people, her Navajo constituency in her area in their status as Utah citizens, right? As county citizens, that's what she was elected to do. But she could not, she cannot speak on behalf of the Navajo Nation. She cannot speak um, on behalf of her people as Navajo citizens. That's not what she was elected to do. She was elected to represent them on the county level. And I'll, so we have to make sure that we have those differentiations um, clear, right? This person was acting on behalf of the county, not on behalf of the Navajo Nation. Um, and we'll get more to this when we ta start talking about treaties, right? When you, treaties are one of the base um, actions that show a government to government relationship, right? Treaties are agreements between two sovereign entities. A government will not go in and make a treaty with a race of people, okay? They won't make a treaty with individual people as as an as just a human being. <laughs> a government makes a treaty with another government. Okay, so in this consultation, in the governor's consultation executive order, he means that you in your state capacity will interact and consult with the tribe in their tribal government capacity. So I, but thank you for pointing that out, uh, Mr. Bigay. I think that's important to realize. And it's, it's easy to mix up if you, if you haven't had to think about this before. Are there questions on that? Because that's a, that's a different type of, of thought process. All right. I don't know if there are necessarily follow-up questions to that, but we do have several questions in the chat. Um, would you like okay. to those? more now <laughs> question um we yeah let's 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 do those till about for a few more minutes okay we'll, yeah we'll, 10 15, just to catch up <laughs> how does a 10 15 for a break sound sounds perfect okay so let's slam on a few more questions um so we've had a little bit of discussion about the language of the eo um, so Paula mentions the language of the EO states um, that an action that may have a substantial tribal implication, you know, be, be what's consulted on. She's concerned that, you know, if a non-tribal person is making that assessment of what is substantial, you're kind of putting the cart before the horse, right? You're saying, you know, I work for, you know, such and such state unit and I'm not tribal and I declare that this is not something that has a substantial impact to tribes. So now I don't go down the road to consultation. Can you comment a little bit about that and how, you know, if there's any tips and tricks um, to help us not make that, make that problem, make that call erroneously. So part of this executive order uh, regarding consultations, uh, the government, and we'll get to this towards the end of this, of this, um, of this discussion is that he asked for all agencies to develop a consultation procedure, okay? But on top of that, he asked for every agency to designate an individual within that agency as a liaison or, or tribal consultation official. So every department and agency should have one, okay? Um, and, and so if you have questions on it and you, and, and you should have a question on it. Uh, 
you should consult your 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 agency's tribal liaison and see what they say okay um and it's always good to err on the side of consultation you know because we sometimes so i i i do um adoption sometimes okay and i usually uh, work with with families that are trying to adopt native children and they're usually native families adopting native children but there's a federal law out there called the indian child welfare act and in some instances it requires that when a, a native child is being adopted you need to notify the tribe and give them the chance to intervene okay now i always do that <laughs> i i always send a letter to the tribe and say hey, I'm a, an attorney, I'm helping this family, they're adopting this child, this child is a member or eligible for membership, this is the circumstances of the adoption, um, uh, would the tribe like to intervene in this, in this adoption? And usually the, the tribe will call me, they'll, try to, they'll call a social worker that may be involved, they'll call it an adoption agent, there's one involved, they'll call the, the birth parents, involved and then the tribe will make a decision about whether or not it wants to intervene and most of the time i almost every time so far i've never had a tribe intervene but every time i've gotten a letter back from the tribe saying thank you for notifying on notifying us of this adoption um, at this at this time the navajo nation um, declines to intervene in this matter you know we wish the new adoption, the adoptive families, good luck and happy future, blah, 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 right? Erring on the side of consultation, okay? You, so that's what I would advise. Um, if it, if, you, if, if you're, if it's, it's when it's very um, subjective and it's pretty sub subjective language, right? Substantial. <laughs> um, uh, it doesn't hurt to err on the side of consultation or at least contacting your agency's uh, tribal liaison in that, okay? I feel like there's a second part of that question that I missed. <laughs> How do you feel about a couple more questions? At least yeah, let's do it. So um, Seth Button says regarding the, the executive order in Utah, it covers a much broader range of effects and relationships than resources that are covered either by section 106, that federal law, or UCA 9-8-404. So his question is, if we're not going to impact archeological sites, but we might impact TCPs, lands, practices, or resources important to tribes, um, we and our federal partners should still consult on those issues, correct? Under 9-8-404. So here's the question. You know, 9-8-44 and the Fed counterpart to it have a narrow uh, description and a narrow definition. The EO has a wider definition. We should use that wider definition and consult on the on the wider definition using the mechanisms of our federal and state laws. Correct. That's what I would advise. I would I would I was always I would always advise on on airing on the side of consultation. And again, if you have that liaison in your agency. They're, they're probably going to be trained on that a little more and and know the practice that's happening you know and if they aren't they can request that training from our office um, but i would always err on that side okay. okay yeah i think that's a good cya policy yeah and because really the this this is about improving relationships and the better you know, and, and you'll, you'll hear many governors say this, the, the healthier Native nations are, the better that relationships are, the healthier the entire state is. If, if we can, if, if the governor can ensure that all the citizens of Utah, so it, it, you know, including those on, on Native lands are, are doing well and, and being taken care of, it helps across the board. So in the spirit of of cooperation and consultation and improving relationships. It's always good to err on that side. Okay. Um, Jason Gibson from the US Army Corps of Engineers asks, you know, our organization, our agency issues hundreds of federal permits each year in Utah. And they send a coordination letter to tribes for each of these actions, 
asking if there are any tribal concerns or issues that they need to meet about, and they almost never receive a response. What Mm -hmm. is the best way to elicit a response from tribes? And should we assume that there are no concerns if we don't hear anything? I I think legally you're able to assume there are no concerns. (laughs) Um, But... um, if, if you know it's important and you know it's something that needs to happen, um, call our office and we'll, we'll hunt down that person that should be responding to them. Um, a little later, a, l- a little bit later down in, in these slides, we're going to talk about why tribes don't respond all the time. A lot of times tribes are understaffed. Um, you got, especially you have small tribes and you have very few qualified individuals to handle certain areas, they'll double up on people. Somebody's going to be social services, the Indian Child Welfare Act, and um, community engagement director, right? They're, they're going to be wearing a whole bunch of hats. And if you're sending them mail, that's a that's an inbox that's just going to get stacked and stacked and stacked. But that person has to go through slowly and slowly and slowly and work through all those and handle them in, a, in, a, in the best way that they see fit. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, what, what I would do is I would call up the tribe and say, I am sending you a letter and it deals with this area of land in this place. There's a deadline on it. So it's time sensitive that we hear a response from you. Um, please be on the lookout of that letter when you re- and, and when you receive it, please respond to us as soon as you can. Right. That to me would be um, meaningful consultation. OK, um, that that is is if you if you need a response and you're listening a response and if you want a response, then you're going to try to get that response. That's more than just a letter. It's more than just an email. It may require a phone call. You know, and before and maybe before all of this, when you're laying the foundations of that, that consultation and that, that relate that consultation relationship, um, especially, I mean, not now during COVID, but when, when these travel restrictions and, and that, you know, in different areas open back up to take a trip out there, you know, introduce yourself. My name's blah, blah. This is who, this is what I do. I'm going to be interacting with your office, you know, and I, I, I want you to, you know, I'm going to ask, I'm going to send this letter to you and I'm going to ask and, it's, and you're going to have to respond in a certain way. You know, usually the responses look like this in this format, you know, um, and um, and so we, we need we'd like your voice. We need your voice and we, we need to know where the tribes stand on this. So if you receive this letter from me uh, or one like it and you don't know how to respond, please give me a call and we'll work it out. Um, but I, I'll, I'll be letting you know when I send these letters and to, to keep a heads up for them. Um, now, if you just, if you don't want a response, right. And if you're, and if it's not, I mean, you're, you're doing your job and sending it out and you're, and you're, you're following the, that, those rules uh, and you know, they're not going to respond, um, but you want a response and uh, you you need to make that effort, you know, and I'm not going to, consultation is a two-way street i'm not putting it all on the state uh, please don't anybody on this on this on, on this um, zoom conference don't please don't think that we're putting all the responsibilities on the state because tribes have to respond tribes have to also form those relationships back with the state um it's just that i'm you know I, what i'm saying is we each have to do our part to get the response that we want or that we feel we need Another question? Well, just sort of a follow-up comment to it. Um, Wendy Simmons Johnson mentions that she has had tribes indicate that just sending one letter with no follow-up is not sufficient for their tribal consultation. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, maybe maybe it is, maybe it isn't under the letter of the law. But I think what you're talking about, about developing relationships is useful here, right? If if you're always having a back and forth, if you have an open open door, you know, communication, then there will be additional opportunities for you to say, hey, did you get that letter regarding, you know, this action? This one's important. I want to bring it to your attention. 
Yeah. And, and it, it, that building that relationship, it, it builds trust. It builds, you know, Hey, I'm, they know it's not your job, but they're definitely appreciative that you're reaching out and giving them that heads up. I mean, I, I work, especially during COVID, we work a, a lot with uh, emergency management and department of health. When we work with tribal, with tribal governments and getting aid to them, a lot of times the tribes will call at the beginning, especially they were contacting our offices. Hey, we need water. We need, or we need, you know, can someone help uh, bring PPE this way? And that's not what my office does, right? Um, I'm not the emergency management <laughs> um, expert. And if somebody wants testing, I'm not the testing expert either. You know, I'm not a health expert. So what our office does is say, hey, tribe, these are who you need to talk to, right? And I, when I respond to that email, I also include Anna Boyton's name on that with emergency manager, or I include Melissa Zito and Jeremy Taylor's name on that email and say, hey, you need a, the person that's able to help you is Melissa Zito in Department of Health. I have CC'd her in this email and all communications of this sort should be directed towards her. If you're unsure with you, please contact her office, you know? But, you know, I, you know, I'm working with Navajo Nation Census and they they needed some help and they, they sent me a form that looked really official. <laughs> it looks like they really wanted some state help and, and they're having trouble gathering census data because of COVID. And I'm wondering in my head, is this something emergency management can help with? Do they provide volunteers? Is it you, sir? Um, you know, they, they want some water at these events so they can get people to, to you know, take part in the census. Is, how, do, how do we get water there? Is water there a PPE at this point? <laughs> you know, or, or is, that, um, is that food water? Is that under emergency management? So I send an email to Anna Boyan. Anna, I don't know if this concerns your, your division, but this is what it's about. This is what they're asking for. Um, let, you know, let me know what you'd like to do. You know, and she calls me back yesterday. Thank you for sending that to me. You know, in this situation, that wouldn't involve us, but thank you for making us aware of the situation and forwarding this on, you know, and we, we like our community, we like this type of communication, right? And that's just between state agencies. That's just between um, department to department and how much better our work goes and how much more efficient we are in, in assisting tribes if we're, if our communication is open, even on things that we're not 100% sure about, we, we're, we're making that effort to find the answers. Okay. Um, would you like to take a, a 10 minute break at this point? Let everybody stretch their legs and make a run for the bathroom. Yeah. Maybe can I actually suggest a 15 minute break and we'll return let's, 10 Let's do it. Let's do it. 15. <laughs> we'll start right at 10 30. 10 30. 10 to 30 will be our start time. Yep. Hey, Elizabeth? Yes. So at 4.58 yesterday, <laughs> the governor's office um, sent me an email saying, hey, there's a cabinet meeting at 10.15. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm going to dial into that. They sent me the agenda. It doesn't look like it doesn't look like I'd be doing anything, really. Yeah, I'm good to go. <laughs> So um, I guess I'll just kind of pick up where uh, we had left off. Um, and again, thank you everyone for asking such um, amazing questions. Um, so we hope to keep this um, the engagement level up. And so um, as where we had left off is with, you know, kind of what is consultation, consultation being the development of relationship based on trust. Um, um, an effort to understand and consider any effects an undertaking may have on consulting parties. And I think that's that's important, especially the relationship building component, because um, a lot of the questions that have, you guys had previously asked, um, you know, what if situations, I think a lot of those could be navigated appropriately or could be navigated good if you have an existing relationship with the tribe, or if you've made active efforts to um, engage a tribe um, in that relationship building process. And that trust building is a, a key component. It does take time. Um, but when you do invest um, in that 
relationship and trust building component, it, it does pay dividends when you are um, dealing with a, with a situation that um, is complex or that can be, get heated at times. Um, also that consultation is uh, an open and mutual exchange of information. It's integral to that effective collaboration, participation, and informed decision-making um, with the ultimate goal of reaching that consensus um, on issues. Consultation is successful when there is when there has been collaborative effort and all parties acknowledge and respect the observations, comments, concerns of each other. So again, going back to that mutual, mutual uh, respect, that understanding, um, you may not understand where uh, the opposing party is coming from, but you know, just to at least um, listen and, and ask those questions so that you do gain that, that, that understanding. And so what is the meaning of consultation? Um, so the meaning of consultation requires in-depth and candid dialogue um, among the consulting parties. Um, a meaningful consultation is also a two-way road um, so that it's more than uh, just notif sending a letter to notify a tribe that you know, you're wanting to um, have an undertaking or you know, uh, posting a legal notice in the local newspaper and when we say two-way road, that you know that also places some responsibility on on the tribal participants as well. So the um, the responsibility doesn't solely fall on on the consulting agencies. So the tribes also have a, uh, some role in that in that participation. Um, also, successful consultations is is a two-way exchange of information, um, a willingness to listen. Um, and an attempt to understand and genuinely consider each other's opinions, beliefs, and desired outcomes. Uh, meaningful consultations are typically based on mutually agreed upon written protocols for timely communication, coordination, cooperation, collaboration. And that's also a, when you, if your agency has a, a consultation or a consultation policy um, that's been developed, um, that's also a good time to uh, maybe on a yearly basis get in the habit of, of providing that document to the tribe. There may have been a change in leadership at the tribe. Um, personnel may have changed within your own agency. And so I think having those yearly reminders of, hey, we have this policy, let, let's just do a, a quick refresh of the, of the policy. And, and, and maybe there are some modifications or revisions that could be um, made to help strengthen that, that document and using that document to guide um, communication between your agency and, and the, the tribe. And so here is just the, um, the definitions, um, again, of what an Indian tribe means. Um, so in this, way, in this context, it's a federally recognized Indian tribe um, listed in the federally recognized tribe um, List Act of 1994. Um, so these are Dustin had already kind of ran through the the eight tribes here in Utah. So you know we do have the Skull Valley Band of Goshute, which is located west of Salt Lake City. Um, Confederated Tribes of Goshute, um, also located west of Salt Lake and about 60 miles or so south of Windover. Um, you have the San Juan Southern Paiute, um, who have um, their tribal lands. They're actually a a, a landless tribe. Um, but they currently have two communities. Uh, one community is located um, just outside of Tuba City, Arizona, and the other community, the northern community, is located near um, Navajo Mountain, Utah, um, on the Utah side. And we have the Paiute Indian tribes of Utah, and so they're comprised of five bands um, that, uh, are, that make up their tribe. Um, to the north of us, we have the Northwestern Band of Shoshone, um, and then to the east, uh, we have the U Indian tribe of the Uinta and Ore Reservation. And then down in San Juan County, we have the Ute Mountain Ute tribe and the White Mesa community, which is located just about a few miles south of Blanding and um, the Navajo Nation.
And so here with the state action with tribal implications uh, refers to regulations, rulemaking, and other policy statements or actions that have substantial direct effect on one or more tribes on the relationship between the state and a tribe or the distribution of power and responsibilities between the state, a tribe, the status of a tribe as a sovereign or governmental entity. And then when to conduct tribal consultation, I think a lot of um, questions have previously touched on this topic. And so we'll just kind of quickly go through these slides here. So to assess whether an action or policy um, decision may affect um, tribal interests, consider some of the following questions um, before taking or making any action, policy, or policy decision. So um, the first question maybe to ask yourself is, is the action, policy, or decision directly targeted towards the tribes, you know, um, in this, um, yeah, and then um, is the action policy or decision designed to include activities um, in Indian country? Um, are federal pass-through dollars designated for tribes attached to the action policy or decision? And does the action policy or decision affect tribal community interests? Um, for example, like um, you know, human health, ecological, cultural, economic, social impacts, or is it close enough to potentially affect such such interests. Uh, I think there was a question that was brought up previously as to um, if you have a non-native person who is trying to make these assessments, you know, is that going to be, um, it, will, will that assessment be shared by, by, the, by the tribal community? You know, uh, yes and no. Um, you know, again, but this is kind of where it goes back to, to that point of relationship building. Um, you have that strong relationship um, with a, with a tribe, and you, you there will be uh, communication channels that are established in that process, and that's where you fall back on um, on, on those established um, strategies or communication channels to to help um, uh, navigate um, whether you should consult a tribe or not. And then, if all else fails, I mean, as Dustin had mentioned before, is you can contact our office and kind of. Um, you know, let us know what the situation is, um, maybe actions that you've taken thus far, and um, then we, we can help make that determination um, for you, or even reaching out to the tribe to identify who to contact within the tribe um, um, to, to make those contacts. Um, even if it comes down to simple contact information, um, our office does um, keep updated um, contact information for each of the tribes. Um, we have their council as well as um, some of their administrative staff um, who, um, uh, who you could reach out to and, and make those initial contacts, or we can make those introductions for you um, if you're comfortable doing that, or if you prefer us to do that, we, we can make those introductions on, on your behalf and kind of pass the baton from there. And so those options are available. Let's see. So Elizabeth, do you want me just to check the chat box or do you just want me to keep going? Um, Cause I, I, I'm seeing a lot of. Um... Yeah, we're, so what we're doing right now is we kind of have a parallel conversation on the chat box and um, that will be available in the email that I send out after this as a follow-up. So James, you don't have to worry about the chat at all. You okay. do your thing and I'm on the controls. Um, if something bubbles up in the chat, and you know we want to talk it out. We we'll, we will do that. Okay. So and then again, continuing when to consult or when to conduct tribal consultations. Um, you know, have any of the tribes expressed interest in and or concerns with a particular issue? Um, so some examples of that is um, with the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe, for example, with the. Uranium uh, mill that's located near their community. Um, the tribe has expressed, you know, concerns about that um, to the state, and so then again, that's where that agency has that uh, responsibility to enter into that consultation process uh, with with the with the tribe regarding that particular issue. 
Um, does the action policy or decision affect the relationship between the state government and the tribe? Um, does the action policy or decision affect the distribution of power and responsibilities between the state government and tribal government? An example of that is, um, will the action affect the status of tribes as a co-regulator or the tribe's right to self-governance? Are there any special legal considerations such as jurisdiction in Indian country? And then uh, under definitions here, we have our tribal officials. So what exactly does, does that mean? You know, so in this context, it means an elected or appointed tribal leader or individual who's been designated by the tribe and authorized to represent the tribe in a government to government consultations. And then it looks like the next section we'll be focusing on is on sovereignty. And I, or did I skip a slide? Hey, James, can you hear me? Yes. Um, why don't you go ahead and um, so you need to go back one uh, slide to fundamental principles. I think you okay. skipped the slide. And then from there, you can go to consultation um, policies right after. Okay. All right. So fundamental principles. So in formulating or implementing uh, state action with tribal implications, agencies, agencies shall be guided by the following fundamental principles. Um, and so the first one is the state government has a government to government relationship with tribal governments um, as set forth in the constitution of the United States, the Utah constitution, treaty statutes and court decisions. Um, the state has recognized the right of the tribes to self government, to self govern them, themselves um, the state desires to work with the tribe on a government to government basis. Um, when an agency intends to implement a state action with tribal implications, um, consultation should occur as part of the meaningful and comprehensive process that promotes effective communication between the tribe and the agency. Uh, the agency should make every effort to ensure that consultation with the tribe is conducted as early as possible, is carried out in good faith, and that honesty, integrity are maintained by the agency at all stages of the consultation process. And so here, we're just gonna kind of, again, review a little bit more of the, um, executive order um, that was outlined. So within, um, when, it, when it was signed, um, agencies had 180 days of, you know, to basically develop their policy. Um, you know, how are they going to um, interface with tribes? How are they gonna consult? What is that communication um, gonna look like? Um, and so there were some parameters that were put out um, that uh, people, So um, some of those, so those uh, parameters were established uh, to kind of guide agencies of how to put this together. So a process to provide an opportunity for meaningful consultation with tribes, uh, which involves contact with, tribal, with the tribal official um, at the earliest possible time when developing or implementing state action with tribal implications. This is important because um, tribes don't want to be notified of an action or a decision after it has happened. And then we would be coming back and say, hey, sorry, we forgot to consult with you. You know, uh, we've already kind of made some decisions thus far, but we wanted to come back and, and get your input. Uh, that, that's kind of a way to, um, a recipe for um, a disaster, so to speak, um, because tribes want to be involved in those discussions as early as possible, especially when it's having um, implications or it's going to impact them and affect them in, 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 uh, in a negative way, they want to have a say in that process from, from the earliest possible time um, that they can start sharing their, their perspectives or providing input into that process. 
um, a process um, to provide reasonable notice when engaging in consultation with the tribal official, a process to provide active participation by the designated agency officials. Um, so the director of each agency subject to this order shall designate how an agency official or officials with principal responsibility for the agency's implementation of this order. However, nothing in this order is intended to deny or limit the ability of a tribe, a tribal member, or tribal representative to speak with any governmental official. If an agency has established consultation policy and or process, um, the agency official shall review the policy or process to ensure compliance with this order. And so the, here the director of each agency shall, um, or the, the director of each agent, agency subject to this order shall designate an agency official or officials with principal responsibility for the agency's implementation of this order. However, nothing in this order is intended to deny or limit the ability of a tribe, a tribal member, or a tribal representative to speak with any governmental official. And if the agency has an established consultation policy, um, or process already in place, the agency official shall review that policy. Oh, that's so issue of mutual concern um, as um, currently practiced by one federal agency, tribal consultation is focused on the consultation itself rather than utilizing tribal knowledge and participation in land management practices. Uh, when adequate consultation does not occur, um, tribal resources are put at risk and the agency loses trust and is vulnerable to litigation. This dynamic places tenuous strain on government to government relationships, personal relationships, and the potential for meaningful consultation in the future. Did you want to add anything else to this, Dustin? I think he's good and we don't have any questions from okay. that. And I don't believe I, nope, I don't see any raised hands. So I think you're good to go. So the next section is kind of a situation assessment methods. Um, this was um, kind of developed as some best practices. Um, so there were eight separate interviews that were held. Um, these interviews lasted from 45 minutes to an hour, um, and the interviews were conducted by Najon and agency representatives. Um, and Najon is just, uh, uh, she's another attorney that works with Dusty a lot. Um, and then, so these interviews focused on process, personal experiences and recommendations. So the next couple of slides will be focusing on kind of um, what are some best practices or strategies that helps make um, consultation successful and what are some areas where mistakes have been made and you know things to um, kind of avoid um, if, 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 at all, if at all possible. So positive points here. So making regular contact uh, makes the working relationship more personal, more personal and more human. Um, so this kind of goes back to that relationship building um, that I have that I had talked about earlier in, in the presentation, where when you have those regular contacts with tribes, it, you establish that relationship. Um, tribal personnel is able to know who you are, and it, it, it just makes the overall um, working relationship uh, positive. Um, people involved decided that it isn't about, it isn't about them, so don't make it personal. Um, it's about who and what they are protecting. Um, and so again, when you are first engaging with tribes, I mean, the reception may be um, may not be as positive as you feel, or you might feel like you're being attacked. Again, it's just the, do not take it personal. Um, there's been a lot of um, there's there's a history of um, broken promises that 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 are still fresh and that are still um, healing, and so just allowing time for that to happen and. Um, being open to to listening and learning 
from them as well. Uh, and then it's also good your agency is reaching out and thinking about um, things like this. So if your agency is proactive and you're um, you're, you're seeking to to cultivate those relationships, you know, um, taking that proactive approach is, is going to be helpful for you. And next, we have some challenges of tribal consultation. So here, um, based off those interviews, um, here's this was a list of items that were shared. So limited experience consulting with tribes. Um, I think this falls both on the agency side as well as, as the tribal side, um, where you know a person may not have um, experience um, of how consultation works, but you you know you just have to kind of I guess dive in and and. and and try to work through those processes. Um, receiving a response from tribes, I think this was brought up earlier in, in the uh, conversation where um, you know, sometimes you, you are sending notices out, you're sending letters, phone calls, emails, but you're not getting a response back from tribes. Um, you know, and as Dustin had mentioned um, previously, uh, just be aware that a lot of tribes do have limited staff. Um, or their, their staff um, wear multiple hats. Um, and so having timely correspondence is, has been an issue. And um, just again, know that um, you're not being ignored um, just to allow time for them to, to respond. Um, and try to overcome box checking. Um, essentially say, okay, well, I emailed the tribe, we sent out a letter, so we'll just check those boxes. Try to um, you know, avoid that type of uh, mentality um to because it 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 it'll just um make things less personal um and uh, even some tribal leaders struggle to know what consultation should look like um so again it, it it's going to fall on both parties um and then making time to consult and build relationships, um, provide meaningful consultation. Um, tribal and agency turnover is also an issue that you know, creates challenges for the consultation process. And it's hard to escape how politics are shaping our relationships. And so that's another factor that you know, we'll have to take into consideration and how to, how to navigate those waters. And desire changes. Um, so, what 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 do we want to have happen? What what would we what would we like to um, the outcomes to be? So, you know, we we would like to improve our relationships. Uh, we would like to establish ongoing dialogue. We would like to uh, you know establish regular scheduled meetings, schedule meetings a year in advance, um, provide entire department trainings. Tribes need to respond on time. Tribes don't want to see the messenger send a manager. They would like to have, or tribes don't want to see a messenger. They want to see a manager, somebody who's able to make decisions and, um, and to have that government to government um, communication. And here are some suggested uh, best practices. Um, federal, so for the federal agency side is, um, you know, to recognize tribes as sovereign nations on an equal footing, uh, provide a consultation policy in writing to tribes. And that also allows uh, you to get feedback to improve your consultations and the communication channels established um, to show tribal input into this, in the decision-making process. Um, tribes want to see that their input is being taken into consideration and implemented in the agency's decision-making process. Um, government to government equals manager to council. So sending, again, not a messenger, but someone who is able to make decisions um, to those meetings to help make them um, more uh, productive. Go to the field or trainings together. Um, behave in a way that builds trust, um, and I did, and I think that that's a, a a very important point is is that trust building component. Um, again, 
to immerse yourselves in ways that uh, you to learn more about the culture, whether that's attending community events, uh, you know, attending a local powwow, uh, you know, just kind of being more engaged in, in those social events is going to help um, you build trust because people are going to see you there. Um, and so then it also helps you as, as, a, as a non tribal member to kind of uh, learn um, some of the cultural ways and and cultural protocols that you could incorporate into your into your professional life to help um, you know cultivate and strengthen those relationships. Um, consult early and cast a wide net. Um, so again, bringing tribes into the conversation as early as possible um, is going to help um, improve those relationships. And um, you know, don't sugarcoat projects. Um, be honest and candid. Sometimes um, you know some of the uh, the situations or the topics or the problems that you're dealing with um, are not pleasant um, or you know they're, they're 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 difficult topics to deal with and just to be honest and candid during those during those um, conversations is going to help um, in that relationship building process and vice versa on the tribes the tribes will likely be candid um, in their responses as well so try not to take it personal um, you know that they're venting, and um, you know, and that and that's just part of the process. And then on the tribal side, you know, is you know, we would encourage tribes to develop a tribal code that lays out the tribe standards for consultation and to share it with the state or to, with federal agencies. You know, just to let you to let agencies know this is how we would like to consult. This is our process. This is who you contact. This is kind of the chain of command. Um, also encouraging tribes to be responsive, um, make it clear that legal representation may not be tribal government, um, to set up a best practice guide, and to define what their priorities are. And then other tips for a successful consultation um, is to get informed and stay informed. You know, you could subscribe to um, email um, newsletters and things. Um, the um, NCAI, which is the National Congress of American Indians, is a great resource. Um, they usually send out policy updates and um, you kind of can stay updated on what is happening within Indian country. Um, recognize, respect, and, and encourage um, cultural differences. You know, be honest and straightforward. Don't make promises you can't keep. Um, get involved in the community. Again, this goes back to attending social events or, you know, maybe your agency could sponsor, you know, other events, whether it's a, a youth program, you know, find there, there are ways to, to get involved in the community, whether that's you as an individual or you as your agency. So, um, you know, just try to seek out those opportunities. Uh, make yourself available, you know, try to be as flexible as much as possible. Um, we, we know that um, everyone is busy, um, but, you know, just try to be as flexible as possible. Sometimes meetings do come up and like today, you know, um, Dustin is kind of double dipping. And so, um, you know, again, just making yourself available and, um, and, and being flexible. Be mindful that each tribe is unique and has a distinct cultural entity. Um, this is important because uh, when people talk about Native Americans in general, a lot of people will think, oh, well, all Native Americans are this way. All Native Americans live in teepees, all Native Americans, you know, hunt buffalo. It, it, that is not the case. Um, so just be mindful of that, that each tribe is unique. They have their own cultural identities. Um, and just to take the time to, um, to learn what those distinct um, identities are. Um, consider cross-cultural communication. You know, also allow adequate time to offer value that is worthy of every person's time. Be aware of tribal poli political changes. Um, this is something that where my office could provide some um, assistance on as well. Um, we will, again, uh, we keep a list of um, contact information. So anytime we know of any leadership changes, we will update um, that the con those contact lists and share it with our agency partners. Um, but you yourself, as you cultivate those relationships with the tribe, just be aware of those political changes that happen within, within the tribe. Um, keep in mind that tribal leaders 
juggle many responsibilities. You know, I'm sure you yourselves have many responsibilities you um, that you're juggling. Just be mindful that tribal leaders and uh, tribal staff have are in similar situations. Um, don't assume one tribe or one leader speaks for all. Um, it's important to um, address uh, the councils as a whole sometimes, or, you know, again, this is where your communication with that tribe is going to um, help determine um, who to speak to. Do you, do you present before the entire council or is it one individual? So again, but just don't go in, into the situ, a situation um, assuming that one person speaks for the entire tribe. Um, even if it's a, a tribal member, a tribal, uh, um, you know, a tribal member cannot speak on behalf of, of the tribal government itself. So um, just be mindful of, of, of that. And then to truly address, um, negotiate and find ways to accommodate the tribe's concerns. You know, go into these situations uh, with your best um, effort to, to find um, solutions to to the issues or concerns that are that are, that are before you. Okay, and then I think I will turn some time back over to to Dustin. Yes, thank yep. thank you, James. We also um, have one question um, from uh, I believe Mr. Gibson, Jason. Are you still? Um, do you still have a question you'd like to ask? Yeah, can you can hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Great. Um, actually, it's uh, two questions, just touching back on a couple of things that you've talked about. <clears throat> One being um, with relationships. Once you've established a relationship <clears throat> and then you have leadership turnover, does that require reestablishing the relationship from scratch or is there generally uh, staff and uh, folks who've been there all along um, who can help with that continuity. I, I think what I found is that continuity can can um, can continue <laughs> and, uh, um, because staff usually does stay. Usually if, if there's a, a change in administration, usually it's only the director that changes and uh, their admin, admin assistants and and everyone else that works in the office, it remains the same. Um, it, it'd be this. It, they happen just uh, a lot like state governments do when I especially when I came into a uh, division of Indian Affairs you know I was so lucky that James Toledo and Dominic Talhafto were there because they have they've been in this um, this office for a number of years and they know people then they they know they have an institutional history um, and knowledge that I didn't have and so when I when I go in to speak and say hey I'm going to meet with so-and-so they can easily say Oh, so and so. This is what they normally we normally talk on with them. These are their concerns, um, and they can prep me for it. And and so, if you if there is a change in admin, I would still advise, um, you know, as much as you can to make that visit, to make that face to face contact, to introduce yourselves. Uh, native Native communities are pretty personable, and 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 making that that face to face visit would go a long way. Great, thank you. And then uh, my other question was. Uh, seeing the list that James put up about uh, regarding the tribes um, in Utah, um, I've heard that the Hopi who are in Arizona claim um, ancestral lands in Utah. Is that correct? And if so, should we reach out to them as well when coordinating on a project? You know, it, it really depends on on the issue. Uh, I, I think you're you you can certainly uh contact hopi and hopi's located in arizona but yeah they i i would definitely seek input from them i don't think you're you're not going to be how am i going to say it's not going to disadvantage you uh, not to get that input um and, and and what you and how you interact with other tribes and, and speak with other tribes and involve other tribes, it contributes to that relationship um, with, with the, well, the state's relationship with the tribes that are inside Utah's borders, right? If the, the eight tribes within Utah see how you're making an effort to communicate and, and, and seek uh, collaboration and advice and, or just gathering information, that's going to affect your relationship. But you're, 
um, I, I would say if you, your, your obligation is to the tribes of Utah, uh, primarily, especially as it concerns the state government. Thank you. Usually what tribes, what, when Hopi um, um, intervenes in a lot of things, it, it, it pertains to sacred sites and usually it's gonna to pertain to, to areas down in Southern Utah. Um, they're, they're part of uh, the litigation involved in Bears Ears right now. And, and the, you know, and when the, the current uh, presidential administration, when, when they, re, well, reduced uh, uh, the boundaries of Bears Ears and, and created two smaller um, uh, uh, protected areas instead. And so that, that, that whole action uh, by the president's office is in, in litigation right now in courts and Hopi does involve himself in that. And the tribes are working together um, on that also. Um, and that doesn't mean they'll necessarily agree on everything, but they are forming a type of alliance to, to protect an area that they consider sacred. Um, Elizabeth, can I can I get can I share a screen again? Can I do that? Let me see. Boom. Sorry, I think I need to be the one to do that. Let okay. Me, <laughs> yeah, let me get you back on. Yeah, I just want to thank James um, for for doing that, and we had talked about sharing in this presentation, and then last night about last night about um. At the end of work day, uh, governor's office uh, sent an email out saying that today um, we were they were going to have a cabinet meeting right during the middle of this. <laughs> so we're like, hey! So it worked out even better uh, for us to have um, James um, do do a portion of of this um, of this training. Um, I and and we're actually I'll probably come back to one of the last few slides uh, of this presentation. But I I think the question comes up with a lot of people: Why are we even here? Why are we even doing this? And why um, why is it important for a state? Um, besides the you know the general answers we've been given, it's like yeah, it, it makes better relationships. It it helps um, people interact and and it creates a more probably an efficient uh, partnership. But why? Why do we do it with tribes? And so I'm going to get to a section that really, I think, gets to the core of that. And I always show this, this slide here. And this slide has, is a bundle of sticks. And it says sovereignty on top. And the reason why I, I share this bundle of sticks, because a lot of people ask me, what, what, what is sovereignty? And you'll get that a lot. You'll, you'll, if you go on YouTube and, and do a I search for elected officials um, answering that question, you're gonna see that it's not an easy question to answer. Um, sovereignty is many things. Um, and, and, and so I'll, 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 I'll just say that. How, how about, you know, it, in the chat, why don't, it, why don't you start filling in what sovereignty is, okay? What, what do you think sovereignty is? And what what makes a government sovereign? All right, let's let's start that going. Let's have a let's have a discussion uh, between everyone that's on and listening through chat, and you can start writing things in on what you think sovereignty is, or what you believe sovereignty is. And I I I I would put money down that everything you write down will be true. <laughs> Some will say sovereignty. I'll, I'll, I teach at Utah Valley University and I teach a subject called American Heritage. And if you were ever um, at BYU or UVU, you probably had to take that class and you probably hated it as much as I did when I was a student. And so I, I purposely don't make that class very difficult now that I'm teaching it. Um, but, you know, I ask my students, what is sovereignty? What makes the United States a sovereign, right? Um, some people will say, well, we have an army and we have a military, right? That's what makes us sovereign. Uh, but are there sovereigns in this world that do not have a military? Absolutely, there are, you know. Um, or some, there are some sovereigns that have militaries that are very restricted on what they can do, right? 
So certainly having a military helps, <laughs> um, but is it required? That's, that's, a, that's a whole other uh, thing. I mean, let's go through this. Um, recognition from outside entities that another entity is sovereign, right? That, that's, that's really good, right? Do other people see you as a sovereign government? Um, and do, do we do that as the United States? You know, do, do we, are there countries out in the world that the United States government refuses to recognize? Right. So for the United States, they may not be a sovereign anymore, but for other countries that do business with them, they may. Right. So recognition, it's a, it's a two way recognition. Absolutely. Um, what makes the, what makes people sovereign? I'm going to say, well, what, what makes country sovereign? Uh, boundaries, right? Borders. Do borders make us sovereign, right? Um, they, it certainly helps, right? Where we can say, hey, this is a territory we have. We occupy this territory. Our legal jurisdiction um, goes up to this line here. Absolutely. Borders. The ability to govern without outside interference. Um, does, and, and I'm going to use the United States a lot as an example when we go through this, because it's uh, usually that's the easier thing to, to consider when we talk about um, sovereignty. But does the United States avail itself to outside interference? Well, sure it does, and in, in, in many forms, right? We, it does through the UN. Does the, does the United States have to follow UN mandates? No. <laughs> um, does any country have to follow UN mandates? No. Um, but we do avail ourselves um, to to that to UN um, um, criticism and, and UN interference in some matters. Um, let's go try another one. Um, having the right to make decisions for your people, absolutely right. Um, one of the early Supreme Court cases involving tribal governments was that tribes were sovereign, and as such, they had the ability they had the ability to make laws and be ruled by them. So absolutely, making laws and decisions for your people. I keep losing my um, my my um, mouse here, so I can go through these. Um, Self government, ability to preserve culture, right? In the U.S., it is the tribal nations who are fairly recognized. Uh, they have treaties with the U.S., meaning. They have their own government and are considered a nation. We are considered a nation within a nation. We handle our own government affairs. Only thing we cannot do as Native nations is have a military or mint our own money. Um, you probably could. <laughs> um, you, we, you know, we don't have a military. A lot of tribes don't have militaries, and there's probably history behind that. Uh, some tribes have law enforcement right not every tribe has law enforcement but a lot of tribes do um some tribes have actually tried to print their own money that's just a very expensive process the mohawk tribe upstate new york tried to print their own money but for their money to have value at the time they they were trying to follow the gold standard and they for all the money that they printed they needed to have gold to back that up right but do you need money to be a sovereign okay. do you do you do you need my, or do you just need credit <laughs> to be a sovereign? Um, do you have to, do you have to be in the clear to be a sovereign? Or can you be trillions of dollars in debt and still function? Uh, I, I, one, one thing that you'll, you'll hear a lot when it comes to tribal um, governments and sovereignty, they say that, well, they're not really sovereign because they rely on the federal government for funding. Uh, does our federal government, does the United States, has it relied on any other country in the world for funding? You know, do we owe other countries money? Um, are we, are we, are we as the United States in the clear? Right. So is it money? Um, probably not. It's probably not money. It's what what really makes. Uh, uh, sovereignty stand out, I think, is is this ability to, again to to have final say over what happens to you. 
Other people may not agree with it. Other countries may not agree with your, your, your sovereign's actions, but it's your ability to have that final say. But also, it's your ability to form relationships with other, other sovereigns, okay? Your ability to form relationships, right? Without a relationship with China, could we have borrowed money from China? Without a relationship with um, uh, Canada, could we have successful trade between Canada and the U.S.? Could we, without a relationship with Mexico, could we, could we make trade deals and agreements with them? So it's not just um, having the power and authority to make laws and, and with internally, but it's your ability to form external relationships. Uh, I'm, I'm, I work as a tribal court judge for the Confederate tribes of Goshu, and that the, our tribe there does not have a jail, doesn't have a detention facility. And so sometimes we use the, the Bureau of Indian Affairs holding facility, which is in Owahi, Nevada, which is a three-hour drive um, from, um, uh, from Ibopal, Utah. And, and sometimes they're full. Sometimes they don't have room for inmate people that we'd like to incarcerate. So I would call up Wendover City or I'd call up Ely, Nevada and say, hey, do you got room in your jail to hold a couple guys? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, how much? And they're like, it's 50 bucks, you know, a day for this many people. And, and so that tribal government I work for, they, they've made those arrangements to, to sometimes hold uh, tribal inmates in non-tribal jails. And now the parents would get really upset about that. You know, you throw my kid in a jail and it's not even a tribal jail. You're giving away our sovereignty, right? And the, the argument to that is what the tribal, government, the tribal council would say is, no, we're actually exercising our sovereignty by forming a relationship with Ely, Nevada and an agreement where they hold our inmates for us, right? Not for free, but we're paying them. But they wouldn't have made that agreement with me as, you know, as just simply Dustin Jansen, Indian living in Ibopa. They would only make that agreement with tribal council, confederated tribes, with uh, a city government, right? A government to government interaction, that relationship. Okay. So it's not being sovereign just isn't making your laws and being ruled by them, but it's also your ability to form relationships with others. Okay. And this is a big thing when it comes to tribal consultation. All right. So uh, it undergirds the way tribal governments relate to their own citizens, to non-Indian residents, to local governments, to state government, to the federal government, to the corporate world, and to the global uh, community. So I was asked to teach um, a uh, or not teach, but I was asked to, to give a, a, a keynote to civics teachers of this, in the state of Utah and, and address tribal government. And for the most part, civics, you learn about federal government, about state government and, and local government. And, and, but you never learn about tribal governments, okay? And so I always ask, where in the constitution do tribal governments um get their authority i'll throw that out there for you where do you think where do tribes get their authority to help you answer that let's go here to state where do state governments get their authority where does the federal government get their authority right so the the u.s constitution outlines the authority of the federal government and then Anything not mentioned is reserved to the states and the people. But what about tribal governments? Well, tribal governments don't, um, oh, I went back the wrong way. Tribal governments don't get their uh, authority through the United States Constitution. Okay. Uh, tribal governments uh, uh, get their authority from themselves. They're inherently sovereign. Okay. How do we know that? Well, we know that because when, when, when European countries began landing on the shores of what we call the United States, there were tribes living on these shores. And these countries that came in to this land struck treaties with tribal governments. How do we know they're tribal governments? Because there was a treaty involved, right? 
You don't make government, you don't make treaties with races of people. You make treaties with other governments. Now, all these treaties that were happening um, at first contact all were carried out prior to the drafting of the U.S. Constitution, right? So we had uh, the, the English crown, the, the French crown, the Spanish crown, all recognize tribes as, a, uh, as political entities, as governments who were able to, to form relationships with them. So our tribes mentioned the U.S. Constitution. Yes, they are, but only under the Commerce Clause. And that affects um, which branch of government can handle the taxing and, and commerce uh, as it pertains to tribes. Okay, that's the only place. Tribes, tribal governments exist separate from the Constitution. Okay, um, that's important to note. Are there questions on that? Okay, if there's none, I'll, I'll, let's see. I'll, I'll come back. Um, I, I usually ask people to define what a tribe is. And most people will come up with this, um, this, this racial definition, right? It's a group of indigenous people connected by biology or blood, kinship, cultural, or spiritual values, language, political authority, and territorial base. Okay, and that's true. That's that's a great ethnic or racial definition of of what it is. Um, but that's not what allows. Yeah, yeah. Someone put the Article One, Section Eight of the Commerce Clause. That's the Commerce Clause. Yeah, that's that's the only place where tribes are mentioned. Um, but it doesn't. It's not a delegation of authority, right? And that you'll get that in Supreme Court cases um, um, as they concern tribes. Are tribes doing this as a delegation of authority from the federal government, or is this just something tribes can do? Is it an inherent power, right? Uh, so a lot of things will come back to this definition here, right? There's this racial definition, but then as it pertains to us in government, we're going to look at this political legal definition and this definition differs because it's a group of indigenous people recognized by the federal government as sovereign where a government to government relationship exists between the group and the federal government okay that's a little different than just lineage kinship and culture okay it's more than that um so and and so in, in, I go back to to treaties, right? An Indian tribe is not legally rec it's not a legally recognized entity in the eyes of the federal government unless some explicit action by an arm of government decides what that it exists in a formal manner. And usually that is as by treaty. It can be done by executive order. It can be done by an act of Congress. It can be done also through going through the administrative courts of, of the United States. But there's a difference here. Oh, I keep pushing the wrong button. Um, this is stuff I, I've just I've said a few times again, <laughs> so we'll move on from that. Um, but I, I'd like to talk to you about some differences here. Um, so when sometimes I, I read the paper, um, not as much as I used to when I first went here, I did, and sometimes I I'll read the paper, especially if they concern tribal issues. And sometimes I'll get uh, an article, come across an article that that shows that uh, tribal members are exercising a hunting right that probably ex exceeds the normal hunting privilege to every um, other non-Indian uh, citizen of Utah. And then I'll read the comments, which you should never do, never read the comments, just kidding. Um, I read the comments and the comments will say, I can't believe these tribes are getting racial preference, right? All because of the tribe's race, this, these tribal members can hunt prior to the normal starting of the hunting season and after the closing of normal hunting season. This is, this is racial inequality. But is it really? Um, are, are, do Indians exercise that privilege uh, because of their race? because they are racially Indian? Or is it because of their legal status as members of a certain political group that had agreements with the government? 
right? Um, let's do a different example. I watch a lot of movies. I watch the the Born Identity, <laughs> and I don't know if how many people have seen the Born Identity with uh, with uh, Matt Damon. And there's this point where he's hanging out in Germany, and Germany or France, I can't remember. Anyway, he's in a he's in a European country, and he has a he has a, a bag full of money, a gun, and also no, he got rid of the gun, money and passports and stuff. And he's walking through the streets, and he notices that he's being followed by the local police, and he's he knows he's a wanted person, and so he's trying not to get arrested by the local law enforcement. So he starts walking fast. They start walking fast behind him. And he sees an American embassy. And when he walks, he starts walking there. And right before they grab him, he flashes his passport to the guards, the Marines at the front gate and says, I'm an American citizen. And they let him in. And then the, the Marines stop the local law enforcement from going in. All right. Why, why do they stop? Why do they allow Matt Damon in? And, and why do they stop the local um, law enforcement from going in? Uh, has, does it have anything to do with, with um, Matt Damon's race? It does not, right? Because America is made up of a ton of different races and ethnicities. The reason why they allow Matt Damon's character into the embassy is because he is a citizen of the United States, regardless of what his race is. He is a citizen. He has the legal status as an American. And he's because he's an American, he's, uh, he's privileged uh, or, or he has access to certain rights and privileges. It has nothing to do with his race. And it's the same thing that 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 applies to, to a lot of these agreements with the federal government and tribal nations. Has nothing to do with them as being native or Indian as a race. Has everything to do with their status as being uh, citizens or enrolled members of a sovereign nation who has agreements with um, the federal or state government. I, I, hope that, I hope that makes sense, right? And certainly, uh, Doug Ballman, he points out that embassies are considered uh, sole property of the country of the embassy that, that, that sits on that land. But again, that privilege comes because of, we would be able to exercise that privilege, not because of our race, but because one, right, it's American soil, two, because of our status as citizens of the United States. All right. So, Anytime you see those disagreements, and especially if Native people are involved, um, step back from that and ask you is and ask yourself: Is this really a a uh, a privilege because of someone's race, or is it uh, an agreement because of someone's legal status and their enrolled membership of a sovereign nation? I think that's going to be something that you you need to ask yourself. All right, let's go on. So I'm going to go through a couple things that that uh, describe the differences between Native Americans and other ethnic minorities, right? Um, one, however you think Native people got here, whether they um, emerged from the land or whether um, some indigenous holy people placed them here, um, whether they crossed the, the, the land bridge, you know, from Siberia into Alaska, or whether they came on a boat from Jerusalem. However you think um, Native people got here, um, they were here first. Um, that, that's a big difference, okay? I'm gonna just start zooming through these because I want us to make sure we have time. Second, you know, there's a, I and mean, right now we have 574 federally recognized tribes. That doesn't count all the state recognized tribes or the tribes that are not recognized formally by any government. Right, um, there they had a land base, they had an economic system, you know, whether it was gold, silver, shells, skins, hides, however you want to do it. They had a governmental system, right? They had they had leadership. 
they had local customs and a lot of a lot of people will say oh well they didn't have laws you know and a lot of native people will say that native people didn't have laws and they still functioned all right well we probably we probably didn't have written laws but we certainly had cultural customs and and re religious rules and cultural rules about who could marry who and what accounted as ownership of 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 of, of anything right those things those socio cultural um, um, rules were always in existence so when, when we say that you know they recognized when european nations began to land on uh, arrive here they recognized this complex system this wasn't just a bunch of people hanging out this these were complex political entities um, because they're political entities, they had treaty making authority. They had, they could form government government relationships. Um, I, I talked a little bit about how tribal rights are not based on the United States Constitution, because they they're not they're not actually protected by the Constitution either. Um, individual in Indians and their status as and their legal status as U.S. citizens are protected by the Constitution, but tribes as a whole are not. Um, and, and that's that's a fuzzy area. Be able to step back and differentiate what status, what legal status are people appearing in, and that'll help clear up things. Uh, Pre-existing sovereign tribes did not derive their inherent governmental powers from federal or state governments. Just what I said a, like a slide earlier. Um, you know, tri treaties, these these agreements between tribes and the federal government in the constitution are said to be the supreme law of the land. Um, so I want you to think about that <laughs> and how we, um, how we approach um, supreme law, the you know, treaties and their status as supreme law of the land. Do we honor those? What's that say about those agreements? What's that say about um, our views on the own, our own US constitution? Um, our, our constitution can be amended, right? Is that what that is? when 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 treaties are ignored and that's probably an entirely different conversation but a question that should be asked third there's a trust doctrine here um, this is a uh, a federally self um, granted doctrine okay in a lot of ways and in a lot of ways it's an agreement between tribal governments and the federal government but only the Native American people and their governments are subject to this trust doctrine, right? So the federal government is pledged to protect tribal property, sovereignty, and would not move for or against tribes without securing tribal consent. Um, this is laid out in, in Supreme Court documents and Supreme Court um, rulings and, and that you can read. The USA would act in the utmost with the utmost integrity in its legal and political commitments to Indian principles as outlined in treaties and governmental policies. Now these are what the trust doctrine is and so, and a lot of times when tribes sue the federal government it's because of a breach of the trust relationship okay I'll just say that up front before we continue. Um, the U.S. would act in a moral manner regarding tribal rights according to their own Judeo-Christian beliefs right so according to your own uh, Judeo-Christian beliefs, that should guide you in how you treat tribes. Okay, so um, look back at that. Is that is that something that's being followed, or is it actually a Judeo-Christian belief? You know, and I guess if you're a historian uh, and religious, that answer is going to change for you <laughs> on, on that. Um, the U.S. would continue to support any additional duties and responsibilities in the self-assumed role as the Indians protectors right um part of the treaties a lot of treaties were made they they formed reservations right they 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 they, they outlined the borders of indian land and in so doing uh they're following this idea of like good fences make neighbors right there was a lot of conflict between tribes and non-indians and so they were hoping these treaties and these boundaries that were set would, would improve those relationships. But who would enforce that, right? You know, tribes said we would we'll enforce on our end, we can we can get our people to obey um, these new borders. Who's going to stop um, the non-Indian or non-tribal member from from violating this this treaty? And it needed to be the federal government, as it would 
acting as a protector in that instance to keep um, uh, bad men from entering into Indian lands. Uh, this is something that tribes are subject to also. It's called plenary power of Congress, right? Uh, the plenary power of Congress uh, was derived solely out of the Commerce Clause um, that, was, that was shared, right? The Commerce Clause that is found in Article 1, Section 8 of the United States Constitution, which basically says Congress um, can conduct, uh, you know, economics with tribes. But from that, from that short sense, Congress has expanded its power. It's expanded the, the definition and the, the authority given under the Commerce Clause um, to this point where congressional power is exclusive, right? Congress under the Commerce Clause is vested with the sole authority to conduct the federal government affairs with Indian tribes. All right. So if you want to... Um, the judicial branch can't do it. The executive branch can't do it. It's a, it's a it's a legislative function, preempted. Congress may enact legislation which effectively precludes state government acting in Indian related matters. So if the if the federal government says we're going to do this with tribes, and if that if that interferes with a state relationship, the federal government can say, hey, that's just the way it is, right? Because the we're the only ones that can that can really do business with tribes on this level and states can't interfere with our business now i'm going to throw this out there that doesn't mean states can't have relationships with tribal governments right but they cannot interfere or undercut the relationship with the federal government and tribes um, the congressional powers are unlimited and absolute Listen to this. This is a horrible definition. I hate this definition. Um, I hate sharing it. <laughs> it's a judicial definition that maintains that the federal government has virtually boundless authority and jurisdiction over Indian tribes, their lands, and their resources. And I think uh, we've all seen that carry out and take place. And, and again, let's go back. Does this mean tribes are not sovereign? No, you know, it, it doesn't mean that. Do you know, because every sovereign throughout the world, if we look back, let me go back to this, to this, uh, my little diagram here. Sovereignty isn't just one big stick of power. Sovereignty is a bundle of sticks of power. And every sovereign throughout the world exercises powers and through its relationships with other sovereigns, may decide to not exercise certain powers. What, how many powers does a sovereign need to lose before it is no longer a sovereign? I guess that's a, that's a question that's always in the making. Uh, or it's always out there and, and people are always trying to answer. But so long as there are sticks within that bundle, that sovereignty remains, right? So long as people are recognizing you as sovereign, you're probably going to be a sovereign, because if they're if they're if they're recognizing your laws and your ability to be ruled by them, if they're recognizing if they're forming relationships with you, um, we're all every every sovereign is gonna is going to to do different things, and every sovereign doesn't have the exact same sticks in their bundle. That's important to realize. So. Uh, when I, when I talk about these things, um, ask yourself, put, if, you're, if you're wondering, is this tribe really sovereign? Substitute the United States in that space where you have tribes, okay? Um, does, that, does that test still hold up? Does the United States have its own money? Can the United States back up its own money? Can the United States, does the United States have a military? Is that military somehow restricted by other nations? Is, uh, does the United States um, uh, exercise powers that limit, uh, put limits on other sovereigns? Does that mean those other sovereigns are no longer sovereign? You know, it's, it's not just one thing, and it's not just one thing to lose. Uh, I saw some comments going up, and go up into the chat feature. Okay, how many sticks can you remove before the bundle falls apart, right? That was the question. 
so long as so long as people are recognizing your government as a sovereign government and they're recognizing your authority to pass laws and they're willing to enter into relationships with you, your bundle is still intact. Right. Um, and see, how does the absolute authority relate to trust responsibility? Um, I, I, let, me, let me figure out how to answer that. It's a, it's a balancing act. Right, because we don't always see, we don't always see the the, the United States um, fulfilling its its trust responsibilities. Okay, and and you're going to see tribes in court, all the way to the federal court, Supreme Court, um, arguing on whether it be about water, whether it be about um, coal, whether it be about um, um, providing a treaty obligation, education, um, health um, uh, obligations. That's a, that's a question that's, that's asked repeatedly every year and goes to court every year, okay? Because the, the United States does not always, um, it's, it's not always seen, I won't say that. It's not always seen to be uh, fulfilling their trust responsibilities to tribes, but that's why they go to court and let a, let a judge decide if it has been fulfilling those responsibilities. But it does create some conflict there. And it creates uh, some balancing, um, a balancing act that, we're, that people involved have to learn how to, to move, move in and function in. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a very good question that, that is being answered in different ways daily. Uh, what are the pros and cons of being uh, uh, a part of a tribe? Uh, pros, Congress has been able to pass legislation that accords a tribe's unique treatment that other groups or individuals are, are ineligible for, medical care, Indian preference in Indian departments, educational benefits, housing aid and tax exemptions. But you got to remember, these are not based on race. These are based on a legal status of being Native American or enrolled in a federally recognized tribe. The cons, uh, legislation also works against them. It, you know, tribes are, are sometimes prohibited from selling land. Um, sometimes the, the taking of Aboriginal title doesn't require compensation. Uh, depending on who you are, um, there's something called the Major Crimes Act. If an Indian commits a major crime, let's say like murder on a reservation, he has to go to federal court rather than to state court. And sometimes federal courts have harsher punishments for the same crime. Um, so if, if, uh, if a non-Indian kills a non-Indian on a reservation, and at the same day an Indian kills a non-Indian on a reservation, they're going to two separate courts. Oh no, not in that situation. I'm sorry. So an Indian kills a kill somebody on reservation land and a non-Indian kills somebody off reservation land, they're going to end up going to separate courts. One's going to the state court, one's going to the federal court. And the punishments may be more severe in the, in, in the federal courts, especially if you're uh, an Indian. Um, so again, not because of their race though, it's because of their legal status as the Indian. There's a, a big case that just came out of Oklahoma um, I should have posted that, um, but I don't know how many people are actually interested in civil and criminal jurisdiction on this, but that's an entirely different discussion too. Um, this is the last one. Okay. So lastly, Indian people are not minority, but a political entity. This is just something that I've been trying to stress the entire time. Okay. Um, when you see that there's differential treatment between uh, native people and other ethnic minorities or just other people in general population uh, step back and ask yourself is this happening because of their status as an Indian or is it happening because of their race as an Indian okay it says host disabled screen oh there it is there we go great boom and share and technology is wonderful again all right so, where's my 
So uh, James did go over this and that consultation order or that executive order that was put out by the governor, he, when he released that, he gave 180 days to, for each agency to, to put together a consultation order and to also um, be able to designate a, a tribal um, uh, official within the agency. Uh, let me go to this. Okay. Um, James, did you hit this? I think you did. The duties of the director of each agency. Uh, no, I, I didn't. I didn't. Okay. All right. That one. So the director of each agency subject to his or her order shall designate an, an agency official or officials with principal responsibilities for agencies implementation of this order. Um, and I talked about how Department of Health and uses uh, Melissa Zito and how emergency management uses Anna Boynton. And, you know, our office attends a lot of meetings with tribes, especially now during this COVID pandemic. And so often, you know, when when these meetings start and and they usually, especially when it comes to like Navajo Nation, Navajo Nation, they're part of the reservation is in New Mexico and Arizona also. And so they, they, they invite state um, offices to come and report and talk about COVID and, or census or voting and how the states are working with tribes. And every time they go to Utah, um, especially when it relates to COVID, they, they just express their gratitude for Anna Boynton and Melissa Zito and Department of Health, Emergency Management, and, and the governor's office and for being able to, to work so well with the tribe. Um, and so it is appreciated and it is recognized. And, and if that person does it well, um, it, the, the efficiency of that work is, is unbelievable. And you know, both Anna Boynton and Melissa Zito are really uh, set on maintaining a government to government relationship, right? Um, individual um, Indians may call the office and say, hey, um, we need PPE or we need testing. Uh, but to re out of respect for that government to government relationship, uh, emergency management and Department of Health will say, okay, we will contact your government and set something up. Okay. The, the, the setup isn't isn't between individual Indians and state agencies. It's between the tribal government and the state government, and so they they respect that relationship, and that's what's been able to keep things so efficient. I'm gonna I I see a couple of lines. Uh, let me see. Is everybody listening? Okay. Um, can we hear me? Am I being heard better? <laughs> um, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll, I, I don't know if what I did turned up my mic, but I, I, I turned it to, for that purpose, <laughs> whether it works or not, we'll see. Um, if an agency has an established consultation policy or process in place, the agency officials shall review the policy or process to ensure compliance with this order, right? Um, a lot of, you know, some people will say, hey, well, how do we even begin? How do we even begin on, on creating a consultation procedure? Okay. And one thing that I, I think is important to do is just right off the bat, contact the tribe. Ask the tribe themselves, do you have a consultation procedure that you would like the state of Utah to follow? as it pertains to health, as it pertains to emergency management, as it pertains to transportation, right? Or right of ways and in that sense. A lot of tribes may already have a consultation procedure in place. You can take that, you can tweak it to make it and find out what, what transfers over and what you'll probably need to talk about. Say, hey, we looked at your consultation process. Um, we, we can do one through 20, but uh, 21 and 23, um, you know, our certain laws in Utah or certain code in Utah, in Utah doesn't allow us to do this. Is there a different way we can handle this? But you might be able to convert a tribal consultation procedure right over into your agency's procedure. Um, Navajo Nation has a consultation procedure. It's a big procedure and it probably doesn't apply to all of you, but they have um, a 
the whole consultation procedure probably doesn't apply to to one thing. It's that's listed. You know, some of it relates to natural resources. Some of it relates to public safety. Um, so go through it and see if you can adapt that um, into your own consultation procedures. Uh, let me see. Okay, as as a governor's executive order, can the agency consultation policy requirements be changed, removed by another governor? Absolutely. Um, you know, executive orders can can be contradicted and and overruled by the the next incoming governor. Um, I, I don't see that happening in in Utah right now. Uh, um, I think both the the both candidates from the the democrat and republican parties are are very open to consultation with tribes and improving relationships with tribes so i don't think that's going to be an issue uh this election year especially i think the lieutenant governor cox has has been very vocal about how um, his his role the state's role with um, tribal governments and and peterson is is very open to uh, sovereign, the tribal sovereignty and, and improving ways to work with tribes in Utah. But yeah, executive orders can change. Um, and, um, and depending on what administration goes forward, but I, I would still move forward with it right now because I don't, I don't, I myself don't see it changing, um, in the near future. And this one's been in place for a while. Granted, it's been in place under the same governor for a long time. Let me see. All right, let's go. Let's look at a couple of things. Um, the executive order actually designates uh, and point and 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 spotlights the Division of Indian Affairs, uh, the director for the Division of Indian Affairs, which is me right now. Um, it outlines some of my responsibilities. Um, one, I'm, pro, I'm supposed to prepare and submit an annual report to the governor and lieutenant governor, summarizing agency compliance with this order. <laughs> How that usually happens is, um, and you're, we leave it up to the agencies really to decide how they report. You know, sometimes we'll get some, a letter from the agency that says, we had no interactions with tribal governments at this time that, that required, the, you know, that fell under the consultation executive order. That might be it. And other times we'll get people say, hey, we interact with this tribe. This was the issue. This is the, the actions that we took. This was the, and this is what ended up being the outcome. So depending on your agency's interaction with tribes, it may be a very long report or a very simple short report. Okay. And then we compile all that and give that to the governor. Okay. Um, we're supposed to serve as the governor's representative when, we, when and this is important, when requested to do so in matters pertaining to consultation and provide technical assistance to agencies in matters pertaining to consultation. Um, most of the time, if if it's, it might be an area that again, where the my office, including me, may not be experts in the matter. And all we're doing is relaying a message from the governor and a stance from the governor. Um, and if it requires a particular expertise, well, we would probably call on the liaison in your agency to come with us. You know, I, if it came to health matters, I would, I would call Melissa Zito or emergency management. I would call Anna Boyan and, and bring them down. I would facilitate the, the, the talk and I would express the governor's concern and, but I would rely on the experts in the field to, uh, to make important decisions as, you know, as, as long as they're in compliance with the governor's concerns, but when requested to do so by the governor, um, C, facilitate government to government consultation and collaboration between tribes and agencies. You know, sometimes a tribe, I mean, or an agency doesn't, has never interacted with a tribe, never interacted with that tribal government, because let's, let's just say they probably never had to. Um, and they're a little nervous right now. They probably heard some war stories from people that have interacted and like, I'm nervous, they're going to yell at us. Ah, don't feel that way. Um, but if you would like us, to introduce you to your counterpart in tribal government, or if you're if you're a first tribal um, representative here that would like us to introduce you to your counterpart in state government, we would be happy to do that. We believe that's part of our job. Uh, we want interaction, collaboration, cooperation to happen. 
And so absolutely, if, if you, something's coming up and you feel like you, you need to consult with tribes, but you don't know how to talk or just make introductions, we will be there. And sometimes just for the first meeting, sometimes it's, we're, hey, we call the meeting. Um, this is so-and-so, this is so-and-so. Um, you guys are, are um, our counterparts because of X, Y, Z reasons. And they'll get talking. And once once you begin talking, once you make those introductions, we probably wouldn't have to be there anymore. Um, but we are there as long as you need us and to make sure that that consultation happens and it's going forward in a, in a good way. Um, Maintain contact information for tribal officials designated and authorized by individual tribes to represent tribes in government and government consultations. If you want to make sure you're speaking to the right person, um, yes, we have those that contact information. And this is probably one of our biggest things. Uh, people will call us and say, hey, this is what I do. Who do I talk to? And we have, we have contact to share. Um, we have public lists and we have private lists and depending on who you are you'll get one of those and sometimes we might be just need to um, contact the tribal official for you and they'll make contact with you but most of the time we share a lot of that contact information um, and again if you want us to be there when you make first contact we're happy to do that i got i think i got a question my mouse is not being super cooperative um is Christine Fire that you're still the uh, executive director for Arizona Governor's Office in the Affairs? I don't know. Um, I was just in the meeting and I, I'm really bad at names. I'm better with faces. Um, uh, but I, I'm, I am, as a uh, division director, I, I do sit in on committees that all they are are, are people just like me. Um, like, yeah, like you said, New Mexico and Arizona, they're called secretaries of Indian Affairs, right? Here, I'm, I'm director of Division of Indian Affairs, but I, I sit in meetings with everyone and that, and if, if they decide to take part in these committees, but I've sitting with my counterparts on this level and with, you know, Wyoming, Montana, Colorado, South Dakota, Arizona, Nevada, and we exchange ideas and we exchange and we talk about ways to improve our relationships with tribes in the state. And that, that is just really our goal. How do we make things better? Um, assist agencies with training for agency officials and employees required uh, in this order. That's what, that's what part of this is. Um, hopefully we, we, we've, we've sold this in a way where you, you want, if you don't have a consultation procedure in place that you, you're, you're interested in starting one. Hopefully if you don't have a designated agency official to serve as that tribal liaison or Travel representative, hopefully this inspires you to do it. And if you need help with that, if you need help in drafting, if you need help in, in, in training that person, that's again, that's what our office is here for. Um, and we'll, we, we can share a different um, consultation procedures to show you how other um, uh, departments and agencies have done it. And, and we can help you get in contact with tribes that may already have consultation, consultation procedures in place. That and that you can adapt and 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 make work with your particular agency. This year we didn't do this. Um, part of this executive order is that we have an annual Native American summit, and and these have been very popular, very popular with um, anybody that works with tribal government. Um, we a lot of the times this is when tribes meet as a whole to speak with the governor, okay? And the governor's office is the chance for the governor to address tribes as a whole. Um, it's also where both tribal government um, employees and state government employees can receive training and, and insight on, on new programs, uh, new software, um, a, a, a refresher on current laws, that just come out of the Supreme Court or federal courts that may affect your relationship. Um, there, so there's there's a lot of reasons that people go there. Uh, a lot of educators go here. Sometimes we have uh, vendors that show up at this um, summit and they sell teaching aids, how to teach um, Indian studies or how to teach uh, certain native languages or how to understand, uh, you know, read materials on working with tribes and, and being better at that. Um, so 
it's a wonderful summit. It's not happening this year because of COVID. A lot of tribes are on travel restrictions, so they weren't able to get out and make these uh, make this make this event. A lot of our attendees are 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 elderly, and you know they're in the high risk categories or they're young, also high risk categories. And we didn't want to create a hotspot for Utah um, just for the sake of having a, a summit. We discussed doing it virtual, um, but from the comments of from the Indian community in the state, it, it, we decided just to postpone it and have it next fall. And so we're looking forward to doing that. Um, that report um, that we talked about earlier, that's when we uh, turned these reports in and about the tribe's interaction with with the state agencies so that's that's a big thing there uh, i've got a comment let me see uh, do your services and the summit apply to federal leaders in addition to state leaders absolutely um absolutely yeah. whether you're working with the federal government or with the state government if you work with tribes um you would benefit from from um uh um, except you would benefit from attending the summit uh, because a lot of a lot of the new trainings and and, uh, and tribal updates are on the federal level, right? Um, and so it's good for the tribes and the states to be aware of these new uh, these new decisions or new new laws or uh, new legislation, new funding, how it works between tribes and the state, how it works between tribes and the feds everybody should attend this summit it's it's really good another summit that we're not in charge of and we don't host is the what they call the res conference it's the reservation economic summit and that happens in vegas i think in usually in february and it's a if you want to if you're if you know if you work with tribes and economics and you want to help them build up uh their economic affairs you know go there um and and uh and see what's available and you can if you're if your tribes you work with can't go share that information with them and say hey there's 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 um there's some there's some funding out there and if it's if you have a native business you know we can work with here and our state agency can help with this it's it's a really good thing um that's me um yeah um in the chat that's my that's my email i i do really well with email if you want to get to me um, that's my cell. So if I call you and you see a 505 number show up, it's not spam. It's me. All right. Let me see. This is just what needs to be um, contained in the report that you give. All right. And then that's that's part of the consultation agreement. And these are just some things that we we used as part of our to help build our our presentation. So this was actually a lot. This was like 40 slides, and that's a lot of slides to, to look at and to be a part of. Um, and, and yes, I, I am from New Mexico, and yes, I do have the green chili hookup, if you were wondering. <laughs> In fact, I have two bags of hatch chili on my counter right now in my house <laughs> that i have to roast today before they go bad um they um <laughs> spam i don't know if spam comes from new mexico but spam is an i wouldn't be surprised if it's an official meat of new mexico <laughs> all right guys uh, do you have any questions for me um, after at the end of all this and 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 seeing all this information? Are is there something that we skipped or you'd like us to to recover uh, and go over and, and just clear up because um, we can? Um, and, you know, I was reading in some of the comments. They there, there's been questions like, "Hey, well, can you talk about?" Uh, you know, are they're interested in criminal jurisdiction? They're interested in civil jurisdiction. They're, um, we we can put something like that together. We can put a training together that that looks over you know current issues in Native America that covers um, you know what's in the headlines and what's coming out of the courts and that may affect your relationship and work your your working relationship with tribes. But absolutely, let me see. Uh, who can I talk to about the Treaty of Shoshone Goshen, 1863? Um, 
One, you could probably talk to the Bureau of Indian Affairs about it. Um, if it's depending on what question you're asking um, about that treaty, you could probably talk to our office about it. We just have to give us time to review that treaty and, um, and we, we'd be happy to help you answer questions. Okay. Um, Span comes from Minnesota. All right. Settled. <laughs> All right. We just call it yum in my house. All right. All right. Well, if, if there's not any other questions, you know, um, uh, thank you. Um, if there are questions and you, you just want to ask them to me privately, uh, my email is right up there in the, in the chat. You know, send us an email. Um, Send an email to um, to everyone in my office. There's only three of us, and uh, but we like to keep each other informed. And usually, any time I get an email when I respond, I include uh, James Toledo and uh, Dominic Telehofty in my response, just so we get in the habit of addressing my entire office. And those red, green, or Christmas. Uh, I prefer red, but it gives me heartburn, so I go green. And if I can, I'll always take Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you very much uh elizabeth i'll just turn it back over to you yeah if there are no other questions then i think we will break just a little bit early um thank you so much dusty and james and dominique as well you guys are an incredible source of information i know i got a lot out of this consultation training and it sounds like a lot of people did too so just for those of you uh, who are who are watching, who are participants, this will be available on YouTube just as soon as my slow rural internet can accommodate that. So look for that later this afternoon. I will also send out an email to everyone with some of the resources that we've had here this afternoon. Um, so if your colleagues, pardon, if your colleagues weren't able to get on, I know a few people had internet issues of their own or conflicting meetings. Um, you can send them the uh, the information here from today. You can send them the video. And I think we're probably going to see if we can start doing this maybe once a year, just as a refresher, just to uh, just to say hi to folks again, because you guys had really great, really great comments. Um, so one more time, thank you again to Dusty, James, and Dominique. And I think that'll do it for us. So thanks, everybody.